Voy a empezar haciendo un pequeño comentario en español. Vamos a darle la bienvenida a los profesores Scott Hershowitz de la Universidad de Michigan y al profesor Nico Stavropoulos de la Universidad de Oxford. Um, we're going to start with Professor Hershowitz with speaking about the end of jurisprudence and the questions will follow and will be open after he's finished with the debate about the end of jurisprudence. So I, I don't think I'll take the full 40 minutes because Carla just told me that the best part of my paper was the end. <laughs> so <laughs> that's an indication that uh, I shouldn't spend too much time on the things that came before the end. Um, but to start at the beginning, <laughs> uh, the paper starts with this image from Wittgenstein, Philosophical Investigations, Wittgenstein, um, uh, the interlocutor that he imagines, the, the interlocutor that he Um, imagines uh, asking him questions, asks, what is your aim in philosophy? And he says it's to show the fly the way out of the fly bottle. If you've never seen a fly bottle, they come in all different kinds of shapes and sizes. They work on the same kind of principle. Uh, there's something attractive to the fly on the inside, and the fly can get in um, by following the scent, but then because they're made out of glass and flies are mostly responsive to light, they have a lot of trouble getting out. And they buzz and they buzz and they buzz around, but they're trapped by their own confusion. Wittgenstein's thought was that most philosophical problems had this structure, right? that we were trapped inside the fly bottle buzzing around only by our own confusion. And the challenge was to find the thought that was causing you the confusion and to free yourself from the fly bottle. Um, I don't hold the view that All philosophical problems, or even most philosophical problems, have this character. But the more time I spend thinking about the Hart Dworkin debate, the more I started to think this philosophical problem does have that character. So the first thing we should do is characterize the debate. And it's been characterized in lots of different ways. I think the argument I'm about to offer you um, applies, regardless of which formulation of the debate you want to adopt, but you need to adopt one. And I'm going to adopt the one that I take it best locates what's at issue between um, positivists on Hart's side and the anti-positivists on Dworkin's side. And so that formulation of the debate runs like this. There are legal facts. It's a fact that on the street in front of my house, um, you're not permitted to drive more than 25 miles per hour. Um, it's a legal fact that in the city in which I live, there um, is property tax assessed at a certain you know, millage or rate. There's lots of legal facts. These facts aren't basic facts about the universe, right? They're not like some fundamental physical facts. There are six kinds of quarks for which we might not be able to provide any explanation other than this is the world uh, that we find. Um, presumably, right, uh, legal facts um, uh, exist in virtue of further facts. And to explain the existence of legal facts, we point to those further facts, right? And so you might think of the hart dworkin debate as a debate about the metaphysical constitution of legal facts. And in particular, it's a debate about the role that moral facts might play in the metaphysical constitution of those legal facts. So if you form, frame the debate this way, you'll get three sorts of answers to uh, the question, what facts determine the legal facts? Right? So the exclusive legal positivist view um, associated with folks like Joseph Raz and Scott Shapiro says social facts, um, only social facts, moral facts, Um, cannot play a part in the determination of legal facts, right? On the opposite side of the view, you get um, Torkin's position, uh, Mark Greenberg's position, uh, it's by the name of anti-positivism, right? Here the thought is, um, yes, social facts play a role. The law is what it is in part because of what people say and do, but moral facts also play a role um, and necessarily so. And then um, you get the Um, position that is in some ways a middle ground position, the position of exclusive legal positivism that says ultimately it's going to be social facts, right? but depending on um, what social facts um, obtain in a particular place, they might make it the case that the content of the law also depends on um, moral facts in the particular jurisdiction. So um, that's the rough framework of the debate. And um, as I you know, try to give a little bit of insight in the paper, but this audience knows Uh, very well. The debate is enormously complicated. Um, it's difficult to resolve. Um, it's been going on for a long time. And the suggestion I want to make in the paper is that there's a way out of this debate. Right? Um, the way out of the debate is to um, deny right, the thought that seems to start it up. Right? What's the thought that starts it up? It's that there is a distinctive domain of legal facts whose metaphysics we need to explain. We need to explain how it is that those facts 
come to be, right? So the paper opens with this story about a speed limit sign around the corner from my house, right, which says speed limit 25, right, to indicate that you can't go over 25 miles per hour, right? And um, there's lots of normative questions, right, that you might ask about that sign. You might ask what prudential, what prudential reasons the presence of that sign gives me, right? So um, it presumably, right, um, other people are going to react to that sign in certain sorts of ways, and they're reacting to that sign in certain sorts of ways will give me reasons to react to the sign in certain sorts of ways. So I think other people are going to drive about 25 miles an hour, and it's safest to drive roughly the speed that other people are driving. Then I should make sure that I'm driving about that speed, right? There are other sorts of prudential reasons that the presence of that sign might give me. It might... Um, uh, if, you know, if there's police around who are in the habit of writing tickets to people traveling, you know, at speeds above that sign and I'm not interested in getting a ticket, I have reasons to um, reduce my speed for that reason, right? We could also ask about moral reasons that um, the sign provides. Maybe it's the case, right, um, that the people who put that sign there had the moral authority to instruct me how fast I might drive. You could tell a Rosian story about why this would be true. Maybe they have greater expertise in figuring out... Um, uh, what's the safe speed at which to drive so that I should take myself as morally obligated to defer to their judgment and their judgment is 25 miles an hour. Or there might be you know, moral consequences of the presence of that sign that are further afield. Perhaps my wife is annoyed at my speeding tickets and so I made a commitment to her. I will not get any more speeding tickets. Right? That requires that I pay attention to signs like this and adjust my behavior in light of them if I know that there are people out there who will write me a ticket if I'm traveling too much above that speed, right, the thought that's causing the trouble is that once we've run through um, uh, these familiar kinds of normative consequences, right, the moral consequences, the prudential consequences, that there's some other kind of question to ask, right? The question is, um, what are the legal consequences of that sign? What are you legally obligated to do in light of the presence of that sign? And um, in a way, right, I, I'm, I want to leave that question open, right, that we might sometimes ask ourselves, what are our legal responsibilities in light of, say, this sign and the history that comes along with it? But what I'm inviting you to deny is that uh, there's a distinctively legal question to ask. There's a legal question which is not, right, either a moral or a prudential question. Right now, um, this audience, I take it there, there are several people at least sitting up at the front of the room, maybe more sympathetic to this thesis than uh, the standard audience um, that I've presented this uh, paper is. But I think there's good reasons that the standard audience is resistant to this thesis, right? There's a lot of our behavior, a lot of things that we say and do that make it seem like there must be distinctively legal rights, obligations, privileges, powers, right? legal rights, obligations, privileges, and powers that are not themselves moral, right? One thing that makes us think that is we all the time distinguish. We ask ourselves, are you morally obligated to do that or are you legally obligated to do that, right? Um, and this seems to be a question that makes sense, right? Not only do we distinguish, um, we recognize that um, our moral obligations and our legal obligations might sometimes conflict, right? And, right, conflict in really horribly terrible ways, right? So we seem sometimes to regard ourselves as under legal obligations to do things that are morally repugnant. So I use the well-worn example of the Fugitive Slave Act in the paper, mm -hmm. right, where the suggestion is um, it seems uh, quite um, natural to say that the Fugitive Slave Act oblig obligated federal marshals to return people who had been accused of being uh, runaway slaves to the people who claimed that they were their owners. Um, and this is morally repugnant, right? So um, if the view on offer is, if the view I'm inviting you to adopt is that there can only be a legal obligation, right, um, when there's a moral obligation, right, it seems like you have good reason to resist the thesis. It seems like there is a distinctive class of legal obligation. And if there is, then the hard to work in debate makes sense. We have to stay in the fly bottle and we have to keep arguing over the constitution of our distinctively legal rights obligation, privileges, and powers. So um, the main body of the paper is an attempt to show you right, that um, the view that I'm inviting you to adopt is not as radical as it first seems. Right? And there's two different ways that I try to show this. The first is to show that there's some practices, lots of practices, that are law-like, um, in that they're practices that we engage in in an attempt to shape the norms that govern our lives. 
that don't lead us to have the kinds of thoughts that we have when we're talking about law. Right now, it might be, right, it might turn out that there are reasons to have it for law and not these other practices, right? So we're going to have to tackle law eventually, but I just want to kind of soften you up, right? So I imagine um, uh, this happened to me once in the midst of writing this paper, right? So, um, and a light bulb went off my head. I, I, I went to a house that we had rented on the beach, and there in the foyer was a sign which said, leave your cares at the door, right? And so I started to think, right, you know, here I am being instructed to leave my cares at the door. Does this in any way bear on whether I ought to leave my cares at the door? It seemed to me that it probably didn't, right? I had independent reason to leave my cares at the door. That was why I'd come to the beach, but other people might come to the beach for different reasons, right? They might come to the beach because it's a quiet place to work on the things that they care about, and then they shouldn't follow the injunction in the sign, right? The sign, right, that said leave your cares at the door and the history behind it, presumably the owner put it there, right, seemed to bear in no way on what uh, the person uh, confronted with it ought to do. But if the sign had said something a little bit different, right, then it might bear on what the person confronting it ought to do. So if the sign said no smoking, right, then we might think that um, assuming the sign got there in the way one would expect, that the owner of the house hung up a sign which said no smoking, right, um, we might think that owners of houses have rights to decide whether or not people may smoke in them. Now, a little complicated here because this is a beach house, right, which the person is holding out open uh, for rent. And, if, you know, it's Nikos renting the house and he comes and he sees the sign that says no, no smoking, smoking, right? He, he should feel like, well, this is just the push I need to stop smoking. But, <laughs> but, uh, but he might feel aggrieved, right, if he had not been notified in advance. And so he might have an interesting conversation. If you are renting out your house and you have this as a rule, do you need to put people on notice in order to obligate them, right? Or is it enough to inform them when they arrive? Um, and I don't want to take a view on that question, right? Um, I just want to say this, right? Um, at no stage, right, in answering that question, would we have to do anything but observe the social facts, right, and then have a conversation about what the moral consequences of those facts are. We don't need to imagine, right, that there are distinctive rental house obligations, right, which we then ask, are they genuine obligations? Um, are, are we legal or are we morally obligated to comply with our rental house obligations in the way, right, that we have this conversation about law where we say there's a legal obligation and now we ask, are you morally obligated to discharge your legal obligations? Um, we don't need to say any of the things that um, the jurisprudence folks commonly say to one another, right, we heard the phrase used uh, earlier today, what are you obligated to do from the perspective of the law, right, we don't at any point need to ask, what are you obligated to do from the perspective of the, the sign, that doesn't seem to help much, we do need to know what the sign says and something about how it got there, but imagining that it has a perspective on the situation doesn't seem to get any leverage, and I walked through um, increasingly um, complicated versions of this. So now it's not just a sign that says no smoking, it's a set of rules, and the rules may seem to have relationships to one another, and then we can add in somebody who's charged with enforcing those rules. And the assertion I make in the paper is that at every stage, there will be more social facts, and there will be increasingly nuanced moral consequences of those social facts for us to debate, but there won't come a stage where we have to say, oh, now I see that there has... Um, a new distinctive kind of, of obligation has popped into being. It's a, an obligation for the rental house, right? Or now the rental house has a point of view on how I should behave, and we'll have to, you know, no point where we say those things and then wonder, well, what makes something a rental house obligation, right? So that uh, stage of the paper is the first aim at softening you up, and then I try and do a similar sort of thing with promises, right? So the thought is that when I make a promise, right, um, uh, I change social facts in ways that have moral consequences, right? And we can um, argue and debate about what the moral consequences are of what I said or did, right, that we take to have constituted um, the giving of a promise, right? But there's no need, right, to imagine, right, that um, when one makes a promise, right, one creates a special kind of thing called a promissory obligation, which may or may not be a moral obligation, right? So if I promise to murder your cousin, Right. Um, I think the right thing to say about this is I promise to do that, but it has um, certainly doesn't have the moral consequence that I ought to murder your cousin. Right. It may have the moral consequence that I ought to abandon my plan or that other people ought to turn me in. There may be lots of moral consequences to my promising to murder your cousin. But there's no there's no reason for us to stop in the middle and say, 
You promise to murder your cousin generates a promissory obligation to murder your cousin, but there's no moral obligation to murder your cousin. The intermediate step just seems um, superfluous, and we don't tend to engage it when we talk about promises. We do, of course, talk about promissory obligations, but just as a species of moral obligation, we do it to mark the source. The reason we think we have a moral obligation lies in this promise, so we'll think of it as promissory. And then I, I attempt to do the same sort of thing um, thinking about uh, rules of games, in particular uh, the rules of chess, since positivists often um, analogize uh, laws, uh, uh, legal systems to games um, for good reason, right? Both of them um, seem reasonably systematic as opposed to the sign that says uh, no smoking. I won't rehearse the details of the argument there, but again, it's the, the point is to say um, that we, um, we navigate right, our interaction with games right? um, uh, by thinking about the social facts. What do the rules inside the box say? Or what do the rules that have been published as the official rules for this tournament say? Right? And what do we think people are obligated to do in light of those rules? We don't have to imagine. Right? So there's a distinctive domain of chess normativity whose metaphysics we have to unravel. Right, so then I come to law. And of course, the problem with law is, as I said at the start, there seem to be good reasons to imagine that there's a distinctive domain of legal normativity. Because um, in contrast, say, certainly with the promising case, we seem to recognize legal obligations to do things that are morally repugnant. Um, and we talk about legal obligations as if there's a kind of independent entity. So this argument, the strategy of that section of the paper is to say, let's just assume for a moment that I'm right, right? Let's just assume that there is no distinctive domain of legal normativity, that um, the only sorts of obligations that are generated by our legal practices are moral obligations, and then I want to show you that there might be good reasons for us to talk about law the way that we do, right, even on the assumption that's true, right? So um, just to quickly summarize the argument of that section, uh, so first, right, as we do with promissory obligations, we pick out a class of moral obligations and attach the label promissory so we can signal something about their source, right, and sort of collect a group of considerations together, we might have reasons to do that with law too, right? We do this all over. It's not just with promises, right? So when I tell you that I can't come to your party because I have a family obligation, I'm not telling you that there's a domain of normativity distinct to my family so that we then inviting debate as to whether my family obligations are also moral obligations. I'm telling you, right, I'm morally obligated to do this Thing. It might be taking my mother to the hospital or, you know, going to my, um, my son's piano recital. But, uh, you know, I'm reporting a, uh, an obligation of the ordinary moral sort and typing it as a familial obligation is telling you something about its source. And the suggestion I make is that oftentimes, right, calling things legal obligations is doing that, right? It's telling you, right, about why it is that you have this moral obligation. And since it's often helpful to indicate something about the source of our obligations, even if legal obligations just are moral obligations, right, we'll have reasons to use the label legal, right? So that's the first suggestion. The second suggestion I make is that it will sometimes be helpful to distinguish obligations that are legal from obligations that are merely moral, right? So we might, um, you know, I give an example in the paper, which I won't fully rehearse here, right, but to suppose that you have an obligation to um, uh, support community efforts to help uh, the poor, or the hungry in your community, right? Um, you have this obligation simply as a matter of background morality, right? And now um, your, uh, your legislature has passed a special tax which will be used to fund these programs, right? And we might think right, that you have an obligation, a moral obligation to pay that tax in part in virtue of the fact that you're morally obligated to contribute, right, to programs that will support the poor in your community, right? But you might think that they didn't ask for enough. This is still going to leave the um, uh, poor in your community, right, underfunded. It's not going to adequately respond to their needs. And so you might find it helpful to say, right, that even after you've discharged your legal obligation to help the poor, there's this remainder. It's a, it's a merely moral obligation, right? They're both different kinds of moral obligations, right? But in, in contrasting, your legal obligation and your moral obligation um, will be, um, again, signaling things about the source, Right, not signaling that these are two entirely different um, kinds of entities. The really hard cases right, are the cases where it seems um, uh, sensible for us to say that people have moral obligations, I mean, sorry, legal obligations to do things that are morally repugnant. 
right? Um, and so here in the paper, I circle back to the example of the Fugitive Slave Act. And I don't think that there's just one way um, to explain what we're up to here, but I, I offer um, what I think um, uh, is going on in lots of these cases. And the story I tell runs something like this, that we, um, we all operate with working theories or heuristics um, about what sorts of changes in the social world lead to what kinds of moral obligations. And you might think that one heuristic that's helpful for navigating legal practices is that when um, a statute is passed right, um, through, the pro in the proper, through the proper procedures, the judges have an obligation to enforce the statute. Now, um, there's going to be all kinds of complicated questions that arise. That's certainly too simple, right? But um, we move very quickly from Congress adopted the statute to um, judges Ought to, um, ought to enforce it, um, and that's a useful guide in the way right, that we might say to one another, you know you really ought to keep your promises. Right? Um, a moment's reflection will realize that that's much too simple. Right? Um, even if promises are binding, there are occasions for keeping your promises, there are occasions for not keeping your promises. Right? It might be that you promise to do something you really ought not have promised to do, right? or it might be that circumstances have changed in the way that in the way that um, you should break the promise and make it up to the person who's, uh, to whom you made the promise, but we move through the world because it's helpful in those circumstances thinking I, um, I ought to keep my promises. Right? And the suggestion I make in the paper is that in lots of circumstances where we find ourselves inclined to say things like federal judges are legally obligated to return people accused of being runaway slaves, right? what we're witnessing is people right, applying their standard heuristic or working theory, right? And it's spitting out a conclusion about legal obligations, right, which um, uh, has to be wrong, right, if I'm right to think that we should just regard legal obligations as a species of moral obligations. And then this is the little twist I add at the end, right? I think awareness of these cases, right, doesn't necessarily give us reason to revise our working theories, right? That we might, so you could make the working theory more nuanced. You could say um, judges should enforce duly enacted statutes unless they're really terrible and awful and morally repugnant. Um, and that might be a more, a, a more morally accurate characterization right, of what judges ought to do. But sometimes, as I put it in the paper, we have reasons to be morally obtuse about our moral obligations. We have reasons not to want to approach the world right, um, engaging in um, the most uh, fundamental or accurate moral analysis that we can engage in. That's going to sound a little elusive. I tried to explain it um, with an analogy in the paper, um, which may make you think that I'm a bad parent, but I will, um, I, will report, I will report it anyway, as long as you promise not to tell my children about it. So um, we say things, right? I say things, and I, I take myself, um, except when I'm doing philosophy, to be obligated to love and support my children unconditionally. Right now, I, but I think right that this is kind of like always obey your promises. Right, that um, there are things my children could do. Right, that would make it the case that I should and would withdraw both my love and support. Right, some people. Right, hopefully it won't be my children. Right, just turn out to be such moral monsters. Right, that they um, don't deserve anybody's love and support. Right, there was a you know with the. Um, with one of the recent mass shootings in the, in the States, there was um, several months after it, um, a really um, uh, moving and depressing interview with the father of the teenager who had um, shot up a lot of, shot a lot of people at the school in which he was struggling with just this, that he felt like he um, should no longer love his son. Um, and I'm not sure that he was wrong about that. Um, but the point I want to make is this, even if, Right. In the final analysis, there are things that your children might do right, that would lead you to withdraw your love and support. You ought not to frame your moral obligations to yourself that way, right, because it's not good for children right, to think right, that your love is conditional, even if in the final analysis it is. It's not even good for you to entertain the possibility. This is why I think I'm a terrible parent, because here I am talking about the possibility right, that maybe my children will turn out to be such moral monsters. There's no evidence of this yet. I mean, um, there's evidence that they're monsters. Right, but really only in the minor and ordinary, uh, ordinary way. Um, so, um, and the suggestion I want to make is that there's a similar phenomena, right, um, that may be at work um, in law, right? The idea is 
that, um, I mean, the reasons are different, right? But we might not want judges, right, or federal marshals um, to think that what I am supposed to do is follow the demands of Congress unless I regard them as morally repugnant because it's inviting them in a way um, to, uh, to see themselves as moral arbiters of the acts of Congress. Maybe, right, um, they'll feel like it licenses them um, to have more space to disagree or to defy than we think that, properly speaking, they ought to. And so we have reasons to state things more categorically, right, than um, in the final analysis morality makes them, right? So we can say things like federal marshals are obligated to comply with the acts of Congress, right, even if we think that sometimes we're, we might think that we want people in that role, right, to regard their duties that way, even if we also hope that they'll sometimes recognize that there are occasions for stepping out of that role, right, um, and framing things a little bit differently. So um, the suggestion is, right, and I think there's probably, um, uh, you know, this is, you know, the suggestion is there's going to be ways, right, um, to account for um, lots of the things that we say and do that make it seem like law and morality really must be two distinct normative domains. And I've, you know, suggested to you some of the ones that I think will figure more prominently. Right. Um, so I'm hoping I'm softening you up enough to accept the view. Right. And then I want to say the view has lots of virtues. Right. So not just because it's mine, um, but uh, it's mine because it has these virtues. So, <laughs> um, so first, right, it's a view um, that allows us to see law as continuous with these other kinds of normative practices. Right. Um, if we don't think that promises or signs posted in rental houses or games are generating their own distinct um, domains of normativity, right? Um, we might, all things considered, think it more sensible to regard law as not doing something categorically different than these other kinds of normative practices, which seem in many ways similar, do, similar do, right? The second and perhaps main virtue of, the, uh, uh, virtue of the view, which led me to originally to be interested in writing this paper, is that if we deny that there's a distinctive domain of legal normativity, then we're out of the fly bottle. Right. Um, we don't need to um, figure out the metaphysics right, of something that uh, um, is we don't need to figure out the metaphysics right, of these um, distinctively legal rights, obligations, privileges and powers. And then the third thing right, um, is the third virtue, I think, is that it allows you to see um, you to appreciate some of the um, or allows you to, to get the benefits, you might say, of, po of both positivism and anti-positivism on the cheap, right? So denying that either position makes sense because their thesis about something that I'm denying exists, right? But um, what positivists want you to see, right, is um, that law is a social practice, and it's a social practice which can go deeply, deeply wrong, right? We can have um, really repugnant statutes. We can have judges behaving in all kinds of terrible ways, right? Um, and they're right about that, right? Um, it's also a view, right, that allows you to um, appreciate the role that morality plays in our argument about what arguments about what legal actors should do, right? You know, Dworkin has the um, has the right picture, right? I think of why we disagree about what the law is. We disagree because we have we have moral disagreements about the consequences of these sorts of social facts, right? Um, and so it's um, an ontologically spare view that frees us from the fly bottle and lets us pay tribute to the things that seem valuable in each of the positions um, that uh, uh, are on offer in the debate that we're um, rejecting. I should say, um, let's see how much. But, uh, oh yeah, it's plenty of time. Um, but I, but I, but the best part of my paper was the end. Yeah. And so I'm going to say a little bit more about the end. I usually don't talk about the end when I talk about this because um, nobody else thinks the best. Well, I mean, they think the best part of the, is the end is the end in that it ends. But um, yeah. But most most people can't can't wrap their head around it after page two or three. So, um, but there, I, because I've got the right people here, right? Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I want to comment on what's a sort of family dispute among those of us um, disposed towards what, you know, Dworkin at the end of his life was calling the one system picture, which is very much like the view that I'm offering you. Um, uh, and so the family dispute runs like this. So suppose, right, you sign up to the thought that um, legal obligations are just a species of moral obligation, right? Um, uh, you know, Mark Greenberg has recently articulated 
a view like this, uh, Greenberg says that legal obligations are the, ob are the moral obligations generated by um, the actions of legal institutions in legally proper ways. Right? So he's using the word legal to mark off a category delineated in part by source, right? but he's also saying that some of the um, changes in our moral obligations that might be worked by legal institutions don't seem properly regarded as legal. Right, so he's narrowing it down um, even further. Right, uh, Dworkin offered a different suggestion in, uh, in uh, Justice for Hedgehogs. He said that our legal obligations are just moral obligations. Law is a branch of morality was his way of putting this point, but that we should think of our legal obligations as being the um, obligations, the moral obligations that are enforceable on demand in court. Right. Um, and, uh, and Greenberg replies to this in part by invoking Larry Sager, right, which makes this a very, uh, you know, a good occasion on which to raise the issue. He says this can't be right because Sager teaches us that um, you can have legal obligations that courts ought not to enforce, right? This is the famous point about the under enforcement of constitutional norms, right? So it may be that there are legal obligations which ought to be enforced, right, by other institutions, by the legislature, by the executive, or maybe, right, um, uh, perhaps even legal obligations that nobody presently has an obligation to enforce. They ought to just go under enforced full stop, but it's really important to see that they're still out there, right? So this Greenberg sees as a reason for rejecting um, uh, Dworkin's thought that moral obligations are just, um, or legal obligations are just moral obligations that are enforceable on demand in court, and the reason he gives in favor of preferring his own kind of view. I should say the Greenberg kind of view is underdeveloped because it, the view is that legal obligations are moral obligations generated by legal institutions in legally proper ways, but we don't yet have an account of what legal institutions are or what is legally proper, right? And my worry, right, about um, Greenberg's attempts to fill out his account and also the attempts to adjudicate between the Greenberg view and the Dworkin view is that it's an invitation to another fly bottle. Right, that um, we have left behind a debate over the distinctively legal um, normative consequences of our legal practices only to take up a new debate. Right? The debate is what is the subset of moral consequences of our legal practices that are properly regarded as legal? And I'm suspicious, philosophically, my philosophical disposition is to be suspicious of line drawing questions like that. My inclination is always to think that there'll be different uh, ways to draw the line for different purposes. So if you're trying to signal something about what institutions in society you can look to um, to vindicate certain, of, certain rights of yours, then you might think something like Dworkin's um, drawing of the boundary is, is going to be very helpful. Right? So somebody might say to you, don't go to court because you have a moral right, but you don't have a legal right. Right? And if instead we're trying to signal something about how it is that these rights came into being, right, then it might be something more like what Greenberg um, suggests will be the helpful way of demarcating the category of the legal um, for those kinds of occasions. Right? Um, I say in the paper right, that it's not obvious to me that we should feel like we're under any pressure right, to pick right, one characterization of the law of our community or the set of moral obligations that are legal obligations, we should always just think not that we're facing a metaphysical problem, right? Not that we've identified something called the law. Right? This is the one part that Carla likes. <laughs> not that we've identified, she told me to start with it and here I am ending with it. She, she, she told me, uh, uh, not that we've identified something called the law whose metaphysical constitution we need to unravel, right? But rather that we face a series of practical problems. We might face them as judges, we might face them as police officers, we might face them as citizens. Sometimes in the course of dealing with those practical problems, we'll find it helpful to regard some of our moral obligations as legal obligations, and we should tailor our understanding of um, the law to the kinds of projects or um, uh, to the kinds of projects that we're engaged in, the kinds of problems that we face, rather than try um, to fix on one characterization of the law. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Just a second. Thank you very much, especially for indulging and for giving me, for asking you to talk about the last part, which I found very interesting. And I find it interesting because it's very provoking, and what we want is a debate, and that's what we're going to do now. 
los invito a que si quieren preguntar incluso en español, no hay ningún problema, podemos traducir las preguntas al maestro Juan Vega, yo, sabe, entonces adelante sin problemas, cualquier duda. We're going to start with um, Georg, Georg. Professor, con el profesor, el tercero del medio. Scott, I, I was on board the argument in the paper, but I got off just before the end. Yeah. Uh, the worst part. <laughs> so, um, so that's the, the, end, the part where you say, well, the debate between Greenberg and Dworkin is equally problematic. It puts us in another fly bottle situation. And I, I want to ask you to say a bit more about the idea or the tendency we have to categorize obligations or reasons in terms of its source. And you give the examples of family obligation. And I want to I wanna ask you why, you know, why we do that. And you seem to be suggesting towards the end there are different contexts in which why we might be doing this. But I want to invite you to dig deeper about why we might be doing this. So in the case of the family obligation, if, if you ask me to go out and I say I can't have a family obligation, and then you ask me, what is that obligation? And I say, well, I want to start, I have to start a family. You will say, well, that's not a family obligation, right? The, the desire or even the reason to start the family is not a family obligation, right? So you will tell me that might be an obligation or right, but it's not a family obligation. And likewise, if uh, as a parent, you know, if I don't spend enough time with my son or not looking after his needs, I'm a bad parent. If I murder my son, it's not that I'm a bad parent. I'm a horrible human being. I'm a murderer, right? So some ways of acting as a parent or as a family member are inconceivably part of the obligation we would attribute. So there seems to be a valid reason to categorize obligations in terms of the source. It's not clear which one would fall in and fall out, yeah. right? And some, sometimes reasons speak to the role of, you know, the obligation of role, like spend time with my kids. Sometimes uh, they don't, like obligation not to murder. We wouldn't say that obligation to murder is a family obligation or the other family, right? Mm -hmm. So there seems to be Uh, the case that morality is made up of these roles, right? And it's a difficult job to identify which reasons fall within that role, right? And uh, of course, roles may be different depending on the context, right? I may be a parent and a, um, a family member and a um, promisee, right? So there may be different kinds. But we seem to want to separate those roles and to be interested in what falls within the role. Yeah. That's not to say that's the end of morality, right? Morality is all things considered. As, as, a, as a moral agent, all things considered are to comply with moral, moral reasons, right? But we seem to be assuming that there are obligations of role with their own reasons uh, attached to them, yeah. and not simply for heuristic purposes. So applied to law, the, the, you get the idea, okay, yeah, the law singles out subset of moral reasons, yeah. And we want to be able to say in which ones fall within or which one couldn't fall within it. Um, that to me saves the idea of normativity because it applies the same in parenthood, in family, as it does in law. Uh, even though it doesn't exhaust my reason, there's perfectly good sense of talking about family reasons and, 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 and parenthood reasons. And I don't think you know, it's so contextual as you seem to be saying. Saying it's contextual means there are different roles. Good. So, right? so, so what, if, what if the suggestion is, yeah, there's a role of the judge, and there's a subset of reasons of morality that apply to the judge. Yeah. That's not the end of his reasons. Of course, you know, if as a judge has to do X, but all things considered has to do Y, that's what he should do. He has to act all things considered. Right. But that doesn't, that doesn't do away with the problem of legal normativity, which is to identify the subset of moral reasons and their source. So I want to agree with everything that you said and just draw a different conclusion from it. So. Uh, I, um, I don't think it's the case that there are no good reasons for um, demarcating a subset of our moral obligations as legal obligations. I think the problem is there are too many good reasons and that they suggest different subsets on different occasions. Right? This is why I want to say what we face is a moral problem and not a metaphysical problem. It's not, so my, so I want you to, I want to invite you to think, right, not there's something called the law And my job as a legal philosopher is to give a metaphysical account of that thing, right? I want, to, I want you to think, right, in the course of judging, right, um, 
what would be the most helpful distinction between to draw between the things that are legal and the things that are merely moral? Right? Um, and there'll be a metaphysics that falls out of that, but as I tried to put it to Nikos last night, the metaphysics will all be moral. They'll be um, founded on the morality of judging. And then the suggestion I want to make to you, you know, we're, um, uh, you know, we're the, the children of Dworkin, right? so we think a lot about judges. Right? We don't think a lot about police officers or county clerks or other kinds of administrative officials. Right? I think that it's possible, right? you know, I have to do the work, right? but I think it's possible that the morality of those roles will suggest different ways of drawing the boundary between the legal and the moral. And so, I mean, I'd be interested, I, you know, I'm very uncertain of this footnote in the paper. Um, so I'd be interested in feedback on it. Maybe it's horribly misguided, right? But um, I, I try to illustrate this very briefly in a footnote at the end where I say, you can imagine, right, um, uh, a gay couple that goes to the county clerk and they say, we would like a license, um, a marriage license. And the county clerk says, <coughs> That, um, that you don't have a legal right to this license and he sends them away, right? And then they go to the district court because they're not satisfied with that answer. And they file a lawsuit, right, seeking mandamus direction to the county clerk um, to issue them a marriage license. And the district court judge says, you have a legal right to this license and I'm issuing um, the mandamus. You have a legal right to this license in light of the 14th Amendment, right? So. Um, it's possible, right, that the best way to think about this, I'm, I should say I'm just genuinely uncertain, is that the county clerk said to them something that was false, right, and um, the district court judge said to them the thing that was true. Um, it's also, right, and that the county clerk would have done better, right, to say something like, you're legally entitled to this, but I'm legally obligated mm -hmm. to, um, to pretend that you're not, right? But my inclination is to think that the county clerk would overstep his bounds even to say that, mm -hmm. right? That it may be that in the role of county clerk, the thing to say is simply, um, you know, assuming the background of a statutory or a state constitutional prohibition on issuing the license, to say you don't meet the qualifications for obtaining a marriage license, you don't have a legal entitlement to it, and leave it at that. Right now, how do you answer this question, right? I think what we have to have is a debate about the, um, the role of county clerk, right? Um, and it may be that the role of county clerk supports just saying the modest thing or the, the, the short thing, you have no legal right to this. It may be that the best construction of the role of county clerk um, is that he should, um, he should draw the boundary of the legal in just the same way we would expect the district court judge to it and also take account, say, of uh, the moral impact of the federal constitution, right? Um, uh, or, Right, there's this, you know, still third way where he might say, um, it looks to me like, you know, so maybe go check that out with the district court and see what they think, but I'm legally obligated to treat you as if you don't have this right. And the question, and, and, and the, the only suggestion I want to make about this is that it strikes me what we have is a substantive moral question and not a question about the metaphysics of, of a single thing called the law. But, Scott, this is ambiguous, sorry to come back, okay. if I may, just very quickly. All you described now could be well explained as follows, which is that, oh, there are two subcategories of reasons, reasons to the judge, yeah. applied to the judge, reasons to the executive. Okay. So that's like the family reasons and parenthood reasons, right? yeah. they're different, or, or, or promissory reasons, right? And you may be right that there are the two different categories. That doesn't do away with the, there being a subset of those reasons called legal, it's terminological, call them Schwiegel, doesn't, have, doesn't mind, matter what we call it. Good. And then we interpret the debate between Dworkin and others as uh, disagreeing about what that subset in, includes, the subset to do with the judge. So just saying that there are different kinds of, of roles. Suppose the county clerk finds himself wanting to say this. He says to the applicants, you know, you have a moral right to get married. I'm really sympathetic. I think, I think that... Um, the law, the law of the state is awful. Um, you have a moral right to get married. The problem is you don't have a legal right to get married. And then you go to the district court, and the district court says you have a legal right to get married. Right? There's a certain kind of picture that says um, one set of these folks has made a mistake. Right? And maybe that's the best kind of picture for us to adopt. Right? What I'm raising is the possibility there's another kind of picture, which says that in these roles, right, you should adopt different characterizations of of which of which obligations are legal obligations? Which, which, which in a 
where you go doesn't really speak to the issue of there being legal normativity. Because, I, oh. because the claim would be that one of those roles has its own distinct normativity. Good. And, you know, it turns, you out, one. Can, it turns out we completely agree. Right? I, think there's, I think there's, in a way, family normativity. So here's the thing you and I completely agree about. There's no distinctively legal normativity. There's no legal normativity that's not also moral normativity. That we agree on. Right? And then the question is, um, uh, the, the, you know, so, so, so within the family of people who think that all legal normativity is moral normativity, right, um, should we then try and figure out which subset it is? And Greenberg says yes, and he has a proposal. And Dworkin says yes, and he has a proposal. And think of me as wanting to be just pluralist, right? I want to say there are occasions on which I will employ something like Greenberg's um, uh, subset and there are occasions on which I'll employ something like Dworkin's subset and I want somebody and I think that there are, there will be reasons for employing You're saying it's only, not only not legal normativity there are other normativities too that's, that's your response your argument is not that there is no legal normativity that there are many normativities one of which is legal that, that's what you're appealing when you say that the county court role and the judge role no. Oh, so you're misunderstanding. I'm, so what I'm saying is that the county, the, the role of county of county clerk, requires you to construe the domain of legal in one way, and the role of judge requires you to construe it in a different way. That's at least I want to hold open that possibility, right? I also want to hold open the further possibility that setting aside roles, that in ordinary conversation, right, um, you might, with complete sensibility, right, um, say to somebody, "Don't go to court. You don't have a legal right." Right, I think this is what Dworkin is picking up on. Right, but then there are other conversations where you'd want to remind them of their Sager. Right, if you're having a conversation with the president, and the president says, "But the court's not going to make me do that." Right, you might want at that moment to say to the president, "But that's not the full extent of your legal obligations because you're trying to call attention to the fact that um, that uh, there's more to the to the practice that's constraining on." This person is not just about being a good guy, Mr. President. It's also that there's this political history which weighs on you in a certain kind of way. And so I can see conversations in which I, I, so I want to be Sager and Greenberg. Right? I have conversations in which I want to be Sager and conversations, I mean, I, mean, I want to be Sager and Dworkin, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Lopez Lorenzo. Right. Thanks, Scott. I really, really enjoyed um, this paper. For the two reasons mainly. Um, one is because um, if you're right, I've just spent the last four years or so on a flawed um, research project <laughs> in terms of trying to find a way in and around the fly bottle. Okay, but uh, for ease of exhibition, I call that you're not alone. No, I, co I call that question the constitutive question. Okay, so the idea that there's a distinctive domain of legal facts, we've got to give a metaphysical account of how it is that they obtain. Um, I think the paper that you wrote helpfully divides into two parts. We've got the positive program once we get out of the fly bottle, as it were. But I want to confine my remarks to the more negative part of the project and uh, offer some thoughts as to why I'm not entirely sure that you've said enough to show why we need to, to think about it in the terms that you suggest. The main reason for that is I think the metaphysics of the paper, probably naturally given your perspective, but in any case is underdescribed. In fact, I think there's a couple of distinctions there which aren't uh, quite clear to me. I'd like to, to flesh them out a bit more. In the paper, you describe your position with respect to legal facts as eliminativist. Right mm -hmm. now, that got me thinking because a similar position in in this uh, in this neck of the woods is what we call a quietist. Okay, so using say the philosophy of mind as our, our as our example, we have a similar problem insofar as we have a more basic level of say facts about neural firings, facts about what's going on in, in terms of the chemical processes in our brain, and then we have facts about the that have aboutness in terms of conscious mental states. Yeah, right. So, as I understand it, what the eliminativist wants to say with respect to that question is. There's no facts there that we need to concern ourselves with. We can explain these in other ways. The quietist, particularly in the, in the Wittgensteinian mold, as I understand it, is yeah. that there's no well-conceived metaphysical issue about the constitution of facts about conscious mental states, facts about what, um, mathematical rules, whatever it, whatever it might be. Right. And I was wondering, it seems to me that you have to be on the quietest side of the, of the ledger because given your positive program, you don't want to deny that there's a well-conceived issue about what constitutes facts with respect to what we ought to do in the moral domain or in the legal domain. What, is the, what seems to be uh, your perspective is, well, this issue isn't really taking us forward with respect to the question that matters, right? So, so 
To, to I, sorry, um, <laughs> it will probably sharpen it up when I bring in the next um, distinction, because okay. uh, they, they're closely related. Um, okay. Throughout the paper, you suggest that to say that there's a distinctive domain of facts about what the law requires is to assume that there's a distinctive kind of normativity that we associate with the law. Mm -hmm. And I don't see why those two are identical. Mm -hmm. okay? When we're concerned with identifying legal facts, as it were, it seems to me that our concern is the subject matter of the inquiry. Okay? Now, that's not to say that the subject matter is determined in descriptive terms or that it's external from the more value-based account that lots of us are receptive to. Mm -hmm. It's just but that so we can, we, can, we can remain confident that there's a domain of legal facts without assuming that there's a distinctive domain of normativity okay. with that. Okay. And that's why I thought that the, you need to adopt the quietest line because you can't deny in all, in, in all consistency the, 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 the picture of what constitutes facts about what we ought to do, particularly if you're talking in terms of reasons. If you think there's reasons about what we ought to do, we can ask why they obtain. Yeah. We can ask in virtue of what facts do these reasons obtain with respect to property obligation, with respect to other obligations. So it's, it, it's not clear to me why we need to abandon that way of framing the issue. Okay. So the, the invocation of Wittgenstein at the beginning is misleading to people who know a lot about Wittgenstein because it invites you to think I'm going to adopt a quietest picture. And I don't really have a quietest picture. I have an element to this picture, but it's narrower than the one that, um, that you want to pin on me. So I, I don't, I'm not a limitivist about legal facts. Right? Um, I'm uh, suggesting a limitivism about the, the following kind of entity. Right? So much of the debate Right. Um, between Hart and Dworkin, between the people that have participated in the debate, since Hart and Dworkin presumes that there is um, a distinct domain of legal normativity. What do I mean when I talk about domains of legal normativity? So let's start with, um, just to make it easy, we could talk about the space of reasons. Right? And so you could think about dividing the space of reasons in different ways. Right? There are aesthetic reasons, and there are moral reasons, and there are epistemic reasons, and there are family reasons. And there are um, uh, there are chess reasons. We can carve the normative space of reasons in lots of different ways. And um, it's possible, right, that some of the domains of reason are distinct from one another, either in part or in whole. Which is to say, maybe it's the case. I don't have a view. Um, uh, I think Stephen did have a view. Maybe it's the case that morality and aesthetics are completely distinct, right? So that aesthetic reasons are just um, they're both reasons, right? So they're the same kind of thing in that way, right? But, they're, um, but you could list all of your aesthetic reasons, and you wouldn't yet have listed any moral reasons, right? Um, or maybe it's the case that they're overlapping, right? Um, and the, um, the presumption, I think, in a lot of the hard work and debate has been um, that there exists within the space of reasons a domain of legal reasons, which is non-overlapping with moral reasons or prudential reasons, right? Um, or... Right, um, in the hands of Roz and uh, Shapiro and some other folks, um, it became the idea that there weren't, um, uh, there wasn't a distinctively legal domain of normativity, but rather there was a kind of quasi-normativity that was distinctively legal. And I want to be a limitivist as about that. Right, it's not an limit. I'm not a limitivist about legal normativity. Right, I just I'm a limitivist about the distinctively the idea that there's a distinctively legal domain of normativity. Right, so. Um, so it's a very it's a very narrow kind of elimitivism, but important, right? Um, because once you deny that kind of um, once once you deny that that entity exists, right, and you say that anything worth calling a legal obligation will just be a moral obligation, you still have metaphysical issues, but they're the standard issues of um, of metaethics. They're not it's not a distinctively jurisprudential problem any longer, right? So. Um, that's what, that's what I take to be um, the target of the eliminativism and the reason I think it frees us from a kind of fly bottle, right? And then I want to say that um, there are interesting questions about which part of moral normativity to regard as legal normativity. And I want to resist the inclination to think that we have to pick just one, right? That there will be Different sets of different sets of facts that we should moral facts that we should regard as legal, depending on what problem we're trying to solve. If you allow, he can, will yeah, can I come in on this on point? This so, so what you just said, I think, is that what you want to eliminate. Oh, I'm sorry. What you just said seems to be uh, this: that 
you want to eliminate uh, the uh, idea of law as a special system. Yeah. So why is that elimination rather than refutation? Why is it not the case that what you want to do is to refute the, the special system's view? The special legal, you know, normative system that constitutes law view. In other words, how you, how is that different from what Dworkin is trying to do? So, so, um, if, if you, you say eliminate, if you, um, demolish the, undermine, get rid of yeah. the special system view, special system view, then the moral view, um, falls out. And if if we convince ourselves that there's no such thing as a special system, normative system that law uh, is, that law is, uh, then boundaries no longer are so important, and all the other implications that you draw on the paper. Right. But why why should we think of your view as a limit, a limitativist, a limitativist, rather than just you know plain old anti-positivism, refuting the positivist view? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think we'll probably spend part of your session doing some Dworkin exegesis, too, right? Um, but uh, there are phases of Dworkin, right? So, I, you know, as I say in the paper, I think the model of Rules 2 is the best thing that anybody ever wrote. And I think in the, you know, not in the history of the world, but in this, in this debate. <laughs> um, and, um, and I think that in the model of Rules 2, in the opening pages, um, Dworkin is um, glimpsing and trying to articulate uh, a one-system picture. I don't think he had it in Model of Rules One, and I think you know he sees that he didn't have it. In, he didn't have it in Model of Rules One, as he says in um, in both Justice and Robes and Justice for Hedgehogs. He says, "When I first started writing about these issues, I made a big concession to heart. I I accepted that." I accepted that law and morality named different sets of norms, and I set out to show that the set of norms that were legal were um, in part determined by um, moral facts, not just by social facts. And in the model of rules, too, he began the project of articulating a very different kind of view, which at the end of his life he named the one system picture, and I think you can see that view being articulated in hard cases. I think you can see it being articulated in the replies, in taking rights seriously, and then I think that it kind of disappears from Dworkin for a while, that when it comes to Law's empire, right, um, he is back in a kind of two-system picture, right, in which um, he is defending the view that morality um, plays a part in determining the distinctively legal dom the content of the distinctively legal domain of normativity. Now, once you get to Justice and Robes, right, and you see Dworkin say um, maybe you should think of these things um, as being part of one system rather than being separate systems, and then you know embracing that view in Justice and Hedgehogs, it's definitely possible to go back and reread Law's Empire as if it's just presenting um, a thesis about. Um, the moral impact of our legal practices. But Dworkin doesn't seem to have read himself that way. Right? He says that he never fully appreciated the consequences of his own view. Hardly anybody engaged in the debate read him that way. And I think it's, you know, it's not the most natural way to read that book. And so, um, as I say at the end of the paper, right, I think of myself as, um, as, as vindicating the, the Dworkin of Model of Rules 2 and the okay. Dworkin of the last chapter of Justice and Hedgehogs and rejecting the Dworkin who was, who spent right. 20 years buzzing around the fly bottle. Fine, but my question, you didn't ask my, my other question, which yes. is, why, why is it the case that you yeah. eliminated the legal domain yeah. rather than eliminated positivist view about the legal domain? Which right. Is another name for reputation. Yeah, so I, um, because I think it's, so I think it's more helpful, right? Um, in getting people to see the truth, right? Not to say that um, that positive uh, that positivism is wrong and anti-positivism is right, but rather to say those are most helpfully regarded as theses about the constitution of a distinctively legal domain of normativity. And it was a mistake to think that there was one, right? We should just see people, right? We should just think that there are social facts and moral consequences of those social facts. And so the question that we took ourselves to be asking right, um, was a question about the constitution of a thing that we have no good reason to think exists. Right? And if you want to say 
Hershevitz, that's just a kind of anti-positivist position. And I'm not, I'm not really bound up in the labels, right? I, um, but I think that um, that it's uh, it's helpful to get people to um, to. In part, I say this because um, the leading positivists never really understood, right, the kind of challenge that Dworkin was posing to them. Right? They, they didn't understand what was happening in Model of Rules 1. They still don't seem to me to understand what's happening at the end of, uh, at the end of Justice for Hedgehogs. And um, I might be mistaken dialectically about this, but I think um, I'd like to put the challenge to them right, of explain to me why we should think that there's a separate thing right, about whose metaphysics we then, we then disagree, right, because they take Dworkin as having a position in that debate. Right, the Dworkin of Law's Empire, and I want to say that no, that's not the that's not the right debate or conversation for us to be having. I think Professor Sager is going to help us on this point. It's never been my intention to help. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I have two questions, and I think they're distinct. I, I, first of all, I I like the paper and the ideas, and I think they are liberating. Um, but the first question is just how liberating, and the second question responds to the can you be Dworkin and Sager point. So on the how liberating, um, I don't imagine that you can say or I can doubt now what I'm about to, but it does seem to me that we may not get very far out of the fly bottle, that we might get into a slightly roomier fly bottle or maybe a better one. But, and the reason I say that is suppose it were the case that promising was an extremely complex social practice, say the intersection of, of primary and secondary rules and so very complicated social fact went into promising. We then would have lots of arguments about promising. And they would be they would be arguments not about the metaphysics or the ontology of a promise, but about whatever it is that a promise adds to the moral situation, when does it add and in what way. Right. And um, I do think that significant segments of the debate between Dworkinians and positivists may be replayed in a liberated and in, and 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 you know more nuanced and and more you know in, in an improved way right. in your model, but that an awful lot of it would remain because we'd be arguing about the moral force of the complex social practice of law. Good. So, and I so that is exactly right. And you know so. Jeremy Waldron has written a short essay um, pursuing kind of similar kinds of themes, and he takes it as an opportunity to say, and now you can see um, you, you can see the case better for normative positivism, right? That we, right, the moral force of these things, right, really is that we um, uh, that we should pay attention primarily to certain sorts of social right. facts, and, and that's and that's round two, right, in some and, profound and way. It, it, it's round two, but it's um, it's such a much better conversation I, to be having. I'm prepared it, to I'm prepared to say that, but I do think there may be a lot of buzzing. Uh, so there's going to be that so will look familiar. So there's there's going to be a lot of there's certainly going to be a lot of disagreement. It's not going, um, but so first of all, I, I think that disagreement between um, a normative positivist thesis like Jeremy's and uh, law is integrity kind of thesis like Ronnie's, where what we're having is an ex explicitly a conversation about the moral consequences of practices of abuse. That's, that's what I would like to see jurisprudence be, right? And, and I think that would vindicate work and suggestion that the, the right thing for us to be doing is having a practice that's continuous with what judges do, right? We have more time and can do it in a more reflective way, but, you know, when judges argue about the moral force of the statute, right, they're having, when they, when they argue about the, you know, uh, you know, whether we should pay attention to the intentions or whether we should pay attention to the text, they're having a local version of the global conversation that um, philosophers might have. So I think that you're right. There, there will be, um, uh, you know, new kinds of positivist and non-positivist positions, right. but they'll be, um, but they'll be presented as moral positions, and we'll understand better what's at stake between us. All that sounds to me right. Okay. Um, on the Tell me why I have to be you. Uh, well, no, it's. It's that I think both in the way you describe the county clerk versus the district court and the Supreme Court versus President Obama, um, I think it is certainly as a – you worry a lot about whether a vocabulary is enlightening or obscuring, and there usually is, are conceptual things implied. I think for the clerk to say the law is or for the court to say the law is, 
uh, and then for the president to say the law is, that's a mistaken and, and, and misleading vocabulary. <clears throat> Both of them should say what the moral influence of the law on me right. is this. And that's a very different proposition. And when the court, if the court says the moral burden of the law on me or force of the law on me is X, and even better says it might be different on President Obama, right. <clears throat> that would be ideal. Right. But at a minimum for the court to say this is the law right. strikes me in the practical sense you like to think about these labels, it's a mistake because it, it, it suggests there is a unitary idea of what the law is. And the notion is so there, are, there, are, there is a unitary description of social fact right. and uh, the moral implication of that varies across institutions. And that would be a different vocabulary. So that might make, um, that might restore the, significantly the difference between Ronnie and me on under enforcement, unfortunately. How would it restore the difference? Well, because then, well, Ronnie, you Ronnie it. would have to say, um, the implication of law on judges is this. It might be different on President Obama. The law is social fact. The implication of those facts, social facts is one thing for the court and another thing for the president. That is something I can be totally sympathetic to. I'm not sure Ronnie can. I guess finally, Professor Kritis. Oh, do you no, want to? I'll hear from you too. Yeah. You want to go with that? I, I, yeah. I wanted to clarify something in Larry's suggestion. Are you saying that the law is the facts and there are different moral each of these people, Obama, the, the court, and the county clerk, are in different moral situations, but well, the law is what it is? Well, because if that's, a, if that's your view, social, working cannot... There are a set of social practices. Okay. And what we choose to call law becomes a very complicated matter. Okay, but it fine. Isn't, it isn't just what I, the actor, should take from those social practices. Okay, that's fine. Because it's but, important, for example, okay. to attribute those social facts inclusive of that to the moral history of the Constitution. I mean, so like, quickly, there's there's something forced about the examples, right? Because of course, county clerks typically just say no, you can't have a license, right? right? Um, or the president says, I'm going to do X, or I'm not going to do X, or I'm I'm obligated to do X, or I'm you know I'm permitted to do Y, um, and you very rarely see, right? So you know, Ronnie says at the beginning of Law's Empire, I'm aiming to explain the truth conditions of propositions like the law requires that. But of course, like that's kind of like airy pompous thing. You don't really see, you know, even very much in judicial opinions. Right? So, um, you know, when people make claims like, I, you know, I'm forbidden to give you um, a license, right? But the question, um, you know, my, my suggestion is we should hear that as a moral claim. Right. Um, you know, we should debate whether the person is properly acting with inside or outside that role. But, you know, to answer like that, you know, to judge whether what they say is true, we never even have to worry about the boundary of the legal and the moral. So I took you to be saying not I'm going to restore the controversy between me and Vorkin, but rather I'm going to show you how most of the time it doesn't matter. Right. And then the question will be what are the occasions on which it matters and what's the best one to choose? Yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, I like the beginning of the paper and the end of the paper and all of it in the middle. So I'm going to, uh, if I can, ask two questions, one about the beginning and one about the end. Um, so um, the, the, the first question about the beginning of, of, of the paper um, has to do with, uh, the, the, is, is actually just an invitation for you to um, uh, clarify your, the strategy. So in response to Nikos' uh, suggestion that what you're doing is refusing, um, you, 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 took a, you took Nikos' suggestion on board, uh, but you said, well, ah, oh, okay. Uh, but, but, but you said, um, uh, you know, there's, it's better to, to draw, it's, it's, my strategy is better as a, a way of drawing in uh, positivists. Um, uh, but then that got me wondering, how much of that are you really doing? And how, mu how much are legal positives, to what extent are legal positives going to be attracted to um, what you're offering them? Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that 
there's much <laughs> in it uh, uh, that would that would make uh, I don't know the, the more moral impact theory more appealing to them. So uh, let me just uh, so in your presentation you said oh I, I'll soften you soften you up yeah. and I, I I take it that's your strategy towards legal positivists. You want to use all these argumentative strategies to soften them up. And then in the paper, and I think in your presentation, you say, oh, there's nothing missing in the moral story yeah. that, uh, that's uh, postulating normativity, uh, a distinct kind of normativity would, would add. You, say, you, you said it, it would be superfluous yeah. postulating such. Uh, now that's, that's not a refutation, right? Yeah. Uh, um, and then you say, um, you say, well, it would be odd to, to suggest that we, w w that, that by posting the sign on the door, we are creating a, a different yeah. uh, source of of normativity. But but, uh, but that, uh, that again is not a refutation of the legal positivist cla claim because a legal positivist will say, no, no, you, you got it all wrong. There's there, there are. You know, I, I have certain resources at my disposal to attribute to law a point of view right. and to, to describe certain normative requirements. You know, they're not, like you said, they're not reasons. They're not real reasons, they're, but they're normative creatures. They're, they're normative requirements. Yeah. Uh, and what I end up with, you, know, you may think is superfluous, but it's, it's a way of reporting uh, the world using a certain conceptual apparatus. Right. The way to, to, to the way to respond to that is to say that this conceptual apparatus is incoherent, right. or there's no such thing as uh, a, a legal point of view. Okay. And I don't, I don't, I don't know how much what what you have to so, say to that. So, so taking the, the points in turn. So I, um, nobody persuades anybody of anything in philosophy. You should just start there. You're hoping, I think, to you know, uh, you know, to to persuade people that don't yet have views. Um, <laughs> uh, so I don't think that um, that I'm offering, uh, you know, uh, that Roz is going to say, you yeah, know, Scott, it, it turns out you've been wrong about everything up until now, and you're right about about this. Um, but uh, when I say that there, there, I have some dialectical reasons for wanting to present things the way that I do is – I think it's a I think it's a helpful way of at least getting people to see the right to see the challenge and respond to the right challenge, rather than um, respond to, respond to a view that I don't take to be the best version of of, of the of not non positive. Dorkin. What's that? Dorkin. Um, so you're telling that both Dworkin and they lost. What's that? that you're telling him that it's not just. Uh, they, themselves, Dworkin also loses. Yeah, the, the Dworkin so of the empire. Yeah. to become Dorkinians. Well, no, they're. What, what I'm suggesting is not. It's not so much about who wins and who loses. It's that I think um, framing the issue right to say there are no distinctively legal facts is a helpful way to get people to see what the challenge is, right, and to invite them to respond directly to that because it turns out there were lots of other ways they conceived of. The challenge. Um, you're quite right, and I suppose this is another way of responding to Nikos's point. There's nothing in this paper that counts as a refutation of the positivist view. I say very explicitly at one point, I can't show you, right? I can't prove to you that there are no distinctively legal obligation, rights, obligations, privileges, and powers. What I can do is offer you a picture of how things go, right? That doesn't include that. Right, and invite you to see that it makes sense of the, that can make sense of, on that picture of the phenomena that you're using that distinctively legal domain to make sense of, and that there are then these independent theoretical virtues, right, that this gets us out of a debate which just turns out to be difficult to, for either, for either side or the other to refute the opposite position, right, um, that it seems to preserve some of the core in, intuitions behind both, right, so nothing here counts as you know, demonstration or refutation. It's an invitation. Think about the problem my way, and then tell me why it's better to think about the problem the old way. I think with that we can give him a warm applause. It's been very challenging and provoking. Thank you very much.
Ahora vamos a hablar sobre, bueno, el profesor Sabrópolos va a hablar sobre interpretación y el significado de la historia. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks for having me here. No, you're very welcome. So, my uh, paper is in the same neighborhood, uh, but I'm going to talk about something more narrow in some ways. I'm not going to offer um, a co a co comments on how to do jurisprudence. Um, so, here I begin with this. Uh, Dworkin's views about law in Justice for Hedgehogs surprised some of his readers. They think that it, it wasn't, didn't used to be Dworkin's view that there's just one system, morality and legal rights and duties are just part of that system. And um, we can perhaps dismiss this kind of feeling of surprise by those readers of the work. And maybe it's only because they're, um, they tacitly accept too much um, of the positivistic way of looking at things, that they used to read the work in differently when he um, explained his theory of law in Law's Empire and before that. And maybe the work is being so direct in Hedgehogs it is um, the surprising part. But we can't dismiss it so quickly, because in a way, so to speak, Dworkin was himself surprised uh, by his assertion. So the assertion is that law is not a rival system of rules that might conflict with morality, but it's itself a branch of political morality. So Dworkin uh, is himself surprised, because he says that even though he saw very early that the two systems view um, of law was flawed and developed a very different picture, he didn't fully appreciate the nature of the picture or how different it is from the orthodox model until much later when he came to consider the larger issues of this book. So um, I think that what's going on is this. I'm going to suggest that uh, actually I'm going to raise two questions. So did Justice for Hedgehogs change the view about the nature of legal rights and obligations? That's my first question. I'm going to answer that question in the negative. I'm, say, I'm going to argue that it doesn't really changed Dworkin's view about the nature of legal obligation. He always believed and argued in favor of the view that legal rights and obligations were moral rights and obligations. Um, and um, he was committed to do so, whether or not he actually would characterize his view that way. And the second question is whether the new, more direct way of describing the territory, describing the situation, might have a different consequences, consequence, which is not that uh, it now exposes us to a different Dworkinian take on the nature of legal rights and duty. But, but whether perhaps it makes us wonder about the proper way to frame the question, the problems of jurisprudence, and more specifically about whether, uh, we should, uh, whether the new view, the new way of, of uh, setting up the issue makes the notion of interpretation and all the apparatus that Dworkin developed along the way um, uh, around the notion of interpretation, redundant or contradictory. In other words, the, the worry here is whether he, the, his, his interpretive conception of law either um, um, smuggles in the rejected special system view, on the one hand, or else is really redundant. We don't need to say anything about interpretation to explain how things are with the law. So these are, these are my two questions. Now, um, let's go back to the um, um, special system view. Now, what do you have to believe in order to believe that the domain of law is a special normative domain? Another way of putting the matter is uh, in terms of the two-system view, but it's not, this is not really accurate because you might believe that law is a special normative domain because you, are, you believe in many systems, right? You believe in the existence of many systems. So what really matters is whether you believe that the domain of law is a normative domain that is special and standalone. Now, how could, you, how could you come to believe those things? One might be precisely to believe that there are many systems, as Hardwood uh, would believe and did believe. So you might think, you might be a non-realist about uh, duties and rights, and you might think that pattern action and attitude uh, constitutes 
rules and thereby rights and duties. And you might think that as long as a practice settles and the right actually develop, that's all it takes for a special domain of normativity to come into existence. And in, for a view such as this, there are many special domains, normative domains. There is the legal domain, there are legal rights and duties, there are moral rights and duties, there are religious rights and duties, there are mafia rights and duties, all sorts of normative domains, each one of them just as real as the other one, as the others. Okay? So that's one way we might come to believe that the legal domain is a special system. Now, another, the question now is whether all it takes to cure yourself of the special system view is to cure your non-realism. But that's not so, because you might be a practical realist and still believe in a special system view. Right? Now, how, how might you do that? You need to do two things. A practical realist might postulate the existence of some moral powers. Now, moral powers are powers <laughs> that an agent has to create new duties just in, by his choices. So the standard example would be that perhaps I can choose to place myself under, under a duty, right? And my choosing to place myself under a duty might make it the case that I am under a duty. So on this understanding of the act of promising, what's happening there is that I convey an intention, thereby, that is, by conveying the intention, to, be, to come under an obligation to perform some action. Right? Or you might have the power to place others under a duty simply by your choices. So uh, on, the, uh, on this view, you might think that when, some, when somebody orders another person to take some action, perhaps under certain further conditions, um, I'm, I'm sorry, if he has, if that person, if the, if the commander has the moral powers, then simply by ordering the other person to take some action, conveying his desire that the other person take the action, it, be, it becomes the case that the other, person, the other person is under duty to take the action. So the moral powers you promises to make it possible to think of uh, law as a special normative system, but not just yet, because the moral powers hypothesis is just a hypothesis about how morality could underwrite um, rights and obligations, the explanation of which must be traced back to uh, the actions or choices of, of some agent. What you, the extra ingredient that you need, the magic ingredient that might allow you to turn the legal domain into a special standalone normative domain is the idea of a point of view. So according to, um, for example, to Joseph Raz and, and many others, it, it is in the logic of certain actions, ordering, promising, and so on, that you mean to place yourself or others under obligation simply by choosing to do so. And if we transpose this picture to law, we might think that it's in the logic of actions such as passing statutes or resolving disputes in a court or adopting regulations by an agency. It's in the logic of those actions that the agents mean right, and hold out themselves as, as having moral powers to obligate others by their say-so. And the way, the way this second hypothesis, on top of the hypothesis about the existence of moral powers, allows us to retain the idea of law as a special moral, moral uh, no, I'm sorry, normative system, is this. From the point of view of the agent who holds himself, himself out as possessing these moral powers, some duties always get made by his actions, right? In his eyes, his orders, he's adopting a regulation or passing a statute, or he's making a promise, in his eyes, by virtue of those actions, some duties come to obtain. So now we have a special normative system, which is not quite a normative system. We're talking about practical realists here, so, so a practical realist wouldn't say that just in virtue of someone's choices, duties came into existence. But it, it is a notional normative system. It's, just, it's a, system, a normative system from the point of view of the agent or, in the case of law, of law as a whole, the legal point of view. So um, this further hypothesis is a conceptual hypothesis about what is implied or presupposed in certain actions such as passing statutes <coughs> or resolving disputes. So that might, might rehabilitate the special system view without um, um, having anything to do with Hart's 
indefensible metaphysics of beauty. So these are, these are two ways. I have no way of showing that there are no other ways, but these are the two ways that I'm familiar with in which someone might defend the special system view. Now, what do you think of Dworkin's view, uh, even in the 70s, uh, subscribing to the two systems view? I don't think that we, we, we really can. So, in, in, other, in other words, Dworkin, we have no indication that Dworkin ever shared these philosophical commitments that are implicated in, in holding a special system view. He was not a moral non-realist, to the contrary. He was often regarded as a mad dog moral realist. And he uh, definitely didn't be believe that there are duties from a point of view or the, that there is certain logic in the action of passing statutes or making promises or anything else. Now, the way, so, I'm trying, I'm trying to try, I'm try, what I'm trying to do here is to find ways in which the working might nevertheless, in spite of not sharing those commitments, be um, committed to the special system view in some way, perhaps without um, noticing. So, perhaps his view used to be, at least in the 70s, hybrid. So, one way he might have held the hybrid view is this the famous rules and principles story. So, uh, according to the standard way of telling the story, Dworkin in the 70s believed that the law consists not merely, not only of rules, but also of principles. Okay? So, f for him to believe that, he would have to believe that the legal practices by themselves, without morality having any role, constitute some normative content, the rules, and then morality comes along and either adds to that normative content, the principles, or subtracts from that normative content by filtering out certain egregious, egregiously unjust results of the rules. Okay? So if he held that view, he would accept that there is a distinct special normative domain, namely the domain that is created by the action of institutions, just by themselves, without morality playing any role. And morality would be restricted to the role of either filtering out some of that normative content or adding to some, that Excuse me, normative content. So, um, it's not, I'm not entirely persuaded. Uh, by the way, I should say that I'll, I'll say parenthetically what my view is about what working believe, but my concern is not that. My concern is what we should believe, how the ideas that he laid out uh, play out. What, ki what kind of view uh, must one have or may one have uh, given some some of the views that Dworkin has put forward. So whether or not he would actually um, self-describe in the way that I, um, I, I described the view is neither here nor there. Now, all that said, in um, the model of rules, the early paper from the 1968, Dworkin makes various concessions. And at one point he says, the positivist will have to concede that the law does not in, uh, include only rules but also principles. And most people take this to be Dworkin's own view, actually, about the matter. It's not, it's not clear that it was his own view about the matter as opposed to a, a move in the dialectic. But it doesn't really matter whether or not he thought that. He thought so back in 1968, because as uh, Scott has been telling us, uh, by a um, couple of years later when he published a, a, um, social rules, um, social practice, I'm sorry, what, what is it called? Social rules. Not a rules, too. <laughs> well, it's called something else. Um, legal, legal... Social rules and legal theory. And legal theory. Thank you. Very, thank you. Social rules and legal theory. He explicitly rejected this kind of hybrid view, right? He did not take in that paper, he explicitly says that a practice, and that would include the legal practices, a practice may affect what we owe to one another, but it does not constitute at all what we own another. And George, uh, early this morning, um, talked, talked about that issue at length. So, um, there's another way, however, in which some special system idea might be smuggled in, and that other way is the following. So, in the 80s, Dworkin spoke about interpretation. And 
we might think that the idea there is this. History, by itself, all by itself, constrains the field of moral principles that add up or make up principal consistency. <coughs> and of course, the relevant distinction here is the distinction between uh, fit and substantive, uh, fit, and fit and justification. So there, there, there's a way to understand the requirement of fit, which would commit Dworkin to a special systems view as at least part of his own view about what the legal world is like. So that understanding has fit be a non-moral requirement, just a conceptual requirement, right? It's not the moral, it's not, that, it's not the case that morality directs our attention to institutional practice. It just, this is just how things are with the law. This is how things just are with the law, right? If, if a legal duty couldn't by, but be a duty that is consistent with institutional practice. And the second way in which fit might be non-moral is this. What it is to fit, what it is for theory, what it is for interpretation to fit institutional history is itself a non-moral matter. Okay? So the kind of consistency that, is, that fit uh, requires between an interpretation and the history of institutions, that relation of fit is a non-moral relation. So fit on this understanding is doubly non-moral. Now, I think both that this is not how Dworkin understood fit, but whether or not Dworkin understood fit in that way, we can understand fit in a different way that does not smuggle in a special system's view. So here's this. I think that in order to appreciate how this works, we have to remind ourselves of the structure of moral explanation. So sometimes in moral explanation, we uh, lay out some moral principle, some moral hypothesis, right? at a very abstract level. And then we elaborate it to draw on implications, and we show, you show, we show how that principle, or how that hypothesis plays out in some more concrete circumstances. And I think that it is central to Dworkin's idea of interpretation that elaboration and successive refinement is what interpretation is all about. Right? This series of steps in which we successively elaborate our abstract conception into or interpretive hypothesis or, and work back and forth between the abstract and the concrete level. I think this is very much what how Dworkin understood the idea of interpretation. So I think that this um, goes a long way towards explaining uh, the uh, um, correct way to reading the requirement of it. So here is the idea. We have an abstract moral requirement that makes abstract moral principle or value or fact that makes institutional history relevant to what rights and duties obtain now. Okay? Now that makes his, institutional history broadly relevant. So already for the first part I said that the non-moral reading of the requirement of fit has two parts. There is a non-moral requirement to fit and there is a non-moral uh, um, um, there's a non-moral um, the, the, what it is to fit is also a non-moral property okay? or the relation that holds between an interpretation and history is non-moral um, so it's not, it's not a non-moral requirement there is a, a moral requirement the Dworkin talks about that at length about the fairness of uh, holding on to previous to past decisions and also the uh, Moral, moral reading of fit that is available does not commit the second kind of uh, dilution of the moral character of the explanation. So there is no non-moral kind of consistency. There's no such thing as bare consistency. It doesn't, it's, not, it's an empty constraint, it doesn't constrain. And anyway, I think that what the way you should understand the uh, interpretation here is this. Um, this abstract requirement that we interpretation fit history suitably elaborated is going to tell us what it is for an interpretation to, to fit history, how to fit history. Okay? So, in other words, morality simultaneously determines w w 
determines uh, the reasons why we should fit and how to fit. Morality, in other words, does that because if we elaborate the ASA requirement to fit institutional history, we'll come to see that it requires that, we, uh, that a particular respect in history is relevant. So the example that Dworkin gives in um, the formal principle in the mid-80s, and he repeats pretty much the same argument in, re in relation to statutes in the Laws Empire, is this. So suppose we are worried about how to understand um, how to understand how to work out the impact of a statute or the Constitution. So we need, need we have various conceptions. For instance, let's suppose that someone suggests that we um, that what matters is legislative intention or the intention of the framers in the case of the Constitution. Okay. Now there are many conceptions, many different different aspects of intention in play, at least logically. Uh, what uh, framers intended to convey, what information they intended to convey, how they intended thereby to change the law, how they would hope the law would be understood by judges, how would be, they would expect the law to be understood by judges, and let's just stipulate they also had something we might call an interpretive intention, that is, an intention that one of these intentions prevail in case they conflict, in case they pull in different directions. Now, how do we choose about all these intentions? And Dworkin says, well, we have to go back to the reasons why we care, why we bother with the Constitution. We have to go back to the reasons why statutes have, have this power to create or destroy rights. And we have to elaborate on this abstract moral requirement and see what that moral requirement requires as, uh, uh, in, when it comes to the choice between these different kinds of intention. And Dworkin there explicitly rejects the idea that some non-moral factor, that is, for example, a kind of intention, will tell us by itself which one of these factors matters. So um, we, didn't, uh, we don't need and we shouldn't understand the requirement of fit and the distinction between fit and justification to smuggle in the idea that history, as it were, determines its own relevance. There's no such thing as uh, the history determining its own relevance and it is morality that determines relevance, or be to see how exactly it does so, you need to work out the account beyond the abstract level of simple, a simple requirement of fairness that mandates um, consistency with past practice. So I don't think that we get any um, dilution of a moral conception of law um, either in the early work or certainly not in the later work. So I think that since Dworkin thinks that at the bottom it is morality that directs our moral attention to institutional practice, morality that makes it the case that what has um, come to pass in the past, that the action of institutions matters in, um, to the legal right, to, I'm sorry, to the rights and duties that we have right now, he is committed to believing that legal rights and duties are moral rights and duties. So that's not um, really an issue. So let me come to my second, my second question. My second question is this. Do we really, do we, did we really need um, the idea of interpretation at all in order to come to the conclusion that legal rights and duties are the moral rights and duties that obtain in consequence of institutional history? Why bother with this, all this elaborate mechanism? Of, um, uh, and the distinction, the troubling distinction between fit and justification, the chain novel that Larry uh, mentioned uh, earlier today. Um, w by the way, let me say a word about the chain novel because I, I suspect it's going to come up in the in the Q and A part of the of this uh, session. So I think that we can understand the chain novel in a way that rejects the idea that what the previous writer has written by itself, without morality playing any role, constrains me, the new writer. I think what, what happens is that in the chain novel story, the aesthetic values that are in play tell me that I have to write, to continue the story in a way that respects what the previous guy has done. And if we elaborate on that abstract aesthetic requirement, this kind of literary value, then, mora then we'll see that the value itself, suitably elaborated, picks out the respects in which 
the previous guy's work concerns me. So it's moral, moral through and through. So we don't need to split um, the uh, final impact. The, the, question, the question, what must I do now, doesn't split into a historical part and a separate moral part. It's a moral question through and through, which, as it happens, because of the content of the, uh, it would not more in the case of, say, novel, aesthetic, literary, okay, it's a evaluative question. As it happens, because of the values that are in, are in play, what has happened in the past um, is relevant to what may and must happen now. Now, do we need to tell all this story about law and literature and about interpretation and fit and justification and so on and so forth? Why not, don't, shouldn't we, why not, not just go straight, cut to the chase and say that we take history and then we see what morality has to say about it and then work out just ordinary moral reasoning. We work out what it is that we owe to one another now. Now, I think that um, if we want, um, um, it depends on what we're trying to do. So if we want to show that we can make sense of the normative situation once a, 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 an assembly has passed a statute, once a court has decided a case, we can make sense of the normative situation without stipulating any special normative do, no, special normative systems. We can make sense of the normative situation simply by considering the history and the morality and see how these, what the outcome of these is for the present case, and that's perfectly fine. But then there's these other guys on the other side who, who may well agree with us that our moral explanation of the impact of history on our rights and duties gets the normative situation right, Get the morality right, they, they, will say, they will say that yes, exactly how your rights and duties have been affected by the enactment of the statute or by the amendment uh, of the Constitution. But they will also say that it doesn't follow from that fact that we have got the law right, the legal situation right. They would say that in order to see whether we got the legal situation right, we have to start at this conceptual part of, that is to do with the logic of actions and see how the law is supposed, constitutional action, I'm sorry, constitutional action is supposed to change your rights and duties. We we'll start there, and then we turn to moral investigation and see whether the law succeeded in changing your rights and duties in the way that it, it, it tried to, it was meant to. Right? And if it so happens that morality, our moral investigation tells us that your duties did change exactly as the law um, uh, was supposed to change them, then we, what would have turned out to be the case is that morality vindicated law's normative pretensions. So in order to get rid of that guy, the defender of the moral explanation, the simple moral explanation, has to say something about why his view hasn't changed this. His explanation, his theory, is not a change of subject. Right? And uh, I think that interpretation, the idea of interpretation, has a role in that, um, um, in that respect. I think that it can help show how a moral account can also be a metaphysical account. And this is something that um, I mentioned to Scott last night, and I, um, I, it might come up again in the discussion in the Q&A. So um, I think that we can think of interpretation as Dworkin um, lays that out as Dworkin's attempt at an alternative kind of metaphysics that is not done in the traditional way of reflecting about what we mean or what we imply or what inferences people who understand the relevant concepts are disposed to draw from uh, what we said and so on. It's a new way of doing metaphysics. It's a new way of doing metaphysics in two ways. It's both substantive, right? It's not formal. It's not about the logic of statements or the logic of action. It's substantive investigation. And, it, and secondly, it's moral substantive investigation. investigation. So if the working is right, uh, an interpretive conception is a conception that aims to tell us things about the nature of an object, 
law, literature, and so forth. And it aims to do to, to do that by um, elucidating the morality of the domain, the moral um, structure of the domain. So it's both sub substantive, more, more is moral investigation, and it aims to explicate the nature of the object. It's some kind of uh, an attempt to f to uncover substantive conceptual truth, if such if such a thing, thing exists. So um, on this conception, law is a postulary concept. That is a term invented by a philosopher of mine, George Ray. And actually he uses Dworkin's um, discussion in um, the middle of law's empire to illustrate this. So a postulary concept in, is a concept where those who possess it, competent thinkers, those who have the concept, those who understand the concept sufficiently to be credited with it, right? Um, notice a, an interesting phenomenon, okay? And also think that there is an explanation of that interesting phenomenon. And they may also have views about what the explanation is. But these views have the form of hypothesis, not uh, trivial truths. So, in a way, these people postulate that some explanation of the nature of that interesting object exists, and they hold themselves responsible, not to their own hypothesis about how that, that thing works, but to the best theory. So, um, Ray illustrates his idea of a postulatory concept, concept, and he thinks that many concepts are like that. Um, by reference to Dworkin's discussion about the value that might perform the role of making institutional practice relevant, uh, normatively relevant, relevant to rights and duties. And if you recall the discussion in Laws and Park, he tries out, Dworkin tries out different um, possibilities. Could it be justice? Could it be fairness? And then he has this argument about, arguments about um, checkerboard statutes uh, and other examples that are designed to show that it can be justice that directs our attention to our past history, and it can be just fairness that directs our attention to past history. So he postulates another, none, none of this would, would have the result that seems so familiar from legal practice, namely the result of um, um, a commitment to start decisis, that decisions should stand, even if they are flawed, even, even if there are good reasons at the time not to decide the way um, the case was decided. So he thinks that there is neither justice nor fairness passed through all the data points. So, so he postulates the existence of another value, and he says that's my moral Neptune. He doesn't put that. He says astronomers postulate the existence of a planet because only that would explain the movement of the other planets uh, in that vicinity. And it turns out they're right. Neptune exists and Dworkin postulated the existence of a value, and he uh, feigns surprise when he and, uh, you know, turns the corner and sees that the value is there, it's integrity. So this is, a, this is the idea of a uh, postulatory um, concept. So I think that this is something that um, might be valuable in the idea of interpretation in all this whole apparatus that Ronnie uh, built. Uh, it is... Uh, I don't think that the idea of interpretation, at least, the, I, I believe that there's a way to understand the idea of interpretation and the apparatus that Dworkin built in a way that does not infect the view with a special system component. And I also think that it's not a redundant view. It's not the case that once we see that legal rights and duties just are the moral, implica the moral implications of in <laughs> institutional history that we don't need to bother with that machinery. Well, we need to bother with that machinery because we ha still have this duty, this th 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 theoretical duty, to ensure that we're, we haven't changed the subject. We're still talking about what these other people before us were talking. And I think that interpretation has a role to play in that way. Now, um, just one last thing, my, my last, <laughs> in my last paragraph, I talk about Scott. 
And I say that um, Scott thinks that we shouldn't even say that legal rights and duties are moral. Right? We should get rid of that category of legal. We shouldn't say that morality, um, um, that the nature of this um, domain is moral. We should just restrict ourselves to history and to moral facts. Social facts and moral facts. Historical facts and moral facts. That's all there is to it. Let's get rid of legal facts. I think that um, I can see many, many uh, advantages to that way of talking about things, but I think that um, the motivation uh, that uh, animated working in developing this big uh, edifice, the uh, theory of interpretation, I think is uh, commendable. I think there is something um, for this uh, machinery to do, which and, and we cannot just ignore it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, uh, Miguel Lopez Lorenzo. Any else? Okay, Nicholas. Um, this paper brings together a number of other papers that you've written in which you try to clarify and uh, make clear what it is that we're doing and we try to elaborate a theory of law along the lines suggested in Dawkins' work. And I, before I raise my question, I just wanted to say publicly how grateful I am for that work and how much I've learned from it. And in many ways, I, I, I raise this question in that, in that spirit. I just wanted to, to get that out of the way first and foremost. But so needless to say, I, I don't have much to offer by way of um, remedying how you think we should go about doing this, this sort of work in legal theory. But I am interested in what remains to be done and how an emphasis on interpretation may speak to that. So when, when Scott speaks about the fly bottle and the, the uh, unrelenting focus on the constitutive question, one suggestion that might be sympathetic to that is that we've got too hung up on the metaphysics in the legal domain. So the, the mantra that is developed is to say, my concern is metaphysical, not epistemic. But there are epistemic questions that are interesting in this neck of the woods. So we can ask a genuine question in saying, well, what do you know when you know the law? I mean, I, I, I teach a little bit of trust. I, I think I know what the law requires on certain points. And I impart it to my students and, that, you know, and life goes on in, the, in, that, in that sense. So an interesting project, it seems to me, or at least an interesting question to raise when we're dealing with the constitutive question is, well, maybe we should expect there to be some level of integration or consistency between these two concerns. We want our accounts of the constitutive question to tie up with a plausible view of what it is to know when you know the law. Okay? Because the beliefs and epistemic practices of judges in particular are partly constitutive of the legal standards in this neck of the woods. So we should expect some reconciliation between the two concerns there. So that brings me to this focus on interpretation. Because I think one thing you can say in favor of Dworkin is he was very acutely aware of this epistemic aspect um, when we're raising metaphysical questions in the legal domain. Interpretation does seem to me to perhaps furnish a useful concept in thinking about how the epistemic aspect of what we're doing when we raise questions about what the law requires and the metaphysical aspects come together. Um, I'm not sure if that's the most fruitful way of putting at it, but it seems to me when you consider he's focusing on judicial reasoning, the extent in which he's focusing on decision-making in the legal domain, it seems to me that his focus on interpretation is to show he wants a metaphysical account of law to tie in with the interesting epistemic questions that we have in this domain of the woods, and maybe therein lies the relevance and importance of that concept in the ongoing project of developing this theory of law. Okay, thank you very much. Now, metaphysicians do are, you tried, you threw that they are snobs when it comes to epistemic matters. And, you know, you always see metaphysicians say, no, 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 that's epistemic. I'm, I'm missing metaphysics. But I think that what's going on there, I think, uh, is this. It's not the case that we shouldn't bother with epistemic issues. It's that it is that we shouldn't confuse the two. And this is what I think mo most people have in mind when they say, no, 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 no I want the metaphysics. So how, how do people figure out what the law is? Well, they read statutes and cases. Okay, fine. Does it follow from the fact that what makes it the case that the law is the way it is, the way it is, is uh, that it says so in these books? So we shouldn't confuse these two. Uh, if we don't confuse them, if it's, if it's the legal epistemology uh, is, you know, a great subject. Now, the other thing is uh, interpretation, and um, you seem to think that interpretation, one, at least one of the things it does, 
the focus on interpretation is that it emphasizes it emphasizes the, a marriage between our metaphysics of, the, uh, of legal standards with an epistemology of how practitioners come about ascertaining their existence and content and that's something that you could furnish as an independent constraint on an account of the nature of law it's something we would among other constraints to be sure but it's something we would like our account of law to do. Right, okay, I, I have no sort of ex-ante um, hostility to that project, but we need to tread very carefully here because, remember, when the working talks about how judges work, how the judges reason, he talks about the superhuman judge. And I think that the, 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 the purpose of this device, when you bring in the perfect reasoner, uh, or the perfect information and so on and so forth. What you're trying to do is to make a point about the nature of things rather than about how to know the nature of things. So I think what the working is trying, what Hercules is doing there is one of the things at least that Hercules is doing there is to mark the following in, in, important fact about the nature of law in the working's eyes, which is that when you decide a ca the question, when you when resolve the question whether George should pay Stephen a hundred pounds. Your decision, in your decision, you are intellectually responsible to the entire institutional practice. In other words, a challenge could come from many quarters. It's not the case that because you have, you're looking at a particular little section in the Sale of Goods Act, that that's all you're responsible to. You're only responsible to work out what that means or anything like that. You, you're really open to uh, the objection that what, the way you just decided, does not really cohere as it should with the law taken together, the legal system taken together. And if that is the case, then your decision is going to fall on appeal, at least if the appellate court sees the problem. So, it's a, so, it's a, so I think that when he talks about Hercules, he marks that fact that the vulnerability of any uh, legal judgment to um, the conception of legal practice, uh, of institutional practice taken together. And, I, and, and of course, even, I think, even though I think, I think that explains why the objection that is very often made in Oxford undergraduate fin finals papers all the time, that, you know, yeah, but actual judges don't have Herculean powers, therefore the, the theory is uh, useless. You know, this is like saying that nobody, you know, can have a complete theory, th physical theory of the universe. Therefore, we shouldn't bother about physics, with physics at all. So, um, now, all that said, I, I agree with you that we shouldn't be hostile to a view that says that how judges actually decide cases, uh, I suppose statistically on, all, on overall, the ordinary judicial reasoning, might be relevant to what the case is regarding rights and duties that we have. And, and I'm not hostile at all, at all to that. And the reason I would say that, that that set of considerations would be relevant would be a moral reason. So if it is really, um, here's, I'm not sure whether that might be, might illustrate the claim or be completely irrelevant. So here's something. Uh, it's often said that this kind of claim, if it were accepted, it would swamp the courts. Okay? And of course, the reason it would, that it, we, should, we should bother about the fact that it swamp the courts is that there are limited resources of time and attention and intellectual ability, intellectual resources, um, to devote to the, the resolution of disputes. And so if we start accepting this kind of claim, the courts will be flooded with claims, for instance, um, de minimis claims, or um, an expansion of liability in a certain direction. And why should that count against my having a right to this decision? The fact that claims such as mine will swamp the court, why should I care, right? I either have a right or I don't. Well, actually, the fact that there are limited resources of judicial reasoning when you have to cherish those and use them uh, frugally, that fact ultimately has an impact on whether I do have the claim right because it, it, it could be argued that whether I do have the claim right turns on the actual, uh, um, the, con the actual constraints, the, um, the actual facts about uh, judicial reasoning. I'm just uh, speculating, but I'm, I'm not hostile 
to epistemic questions that you know, we shouldn't have. We shouldn't think that these views are, should be hostile to those questions. So I guess as you, as you know, I think it's a terrific paper. Um, I'm a little perplexed just by the the way that it opens, the framing um, in the beginning. So I think you, you say, well, why is it you would have a two systems view or a, or a special systems view or a many systems view? You say well, one reason might be a kind of anti-realist picture in which there are mafia reasons and there are revenge-based reasons, and Hart may have had a picture like that. And another reason is um, a Ra's kind of moral power story. Um, what's that? The moral power story is only enough. Right. Perhaps there are moral powers, as I, I doubt. Yeah. It's only enough. You need this other conceptual story. Uh, right, about the point of view, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that struck me as... Um, Inverting the order of explanation, okay. that um, the uh, Hart and Raz take there to be two systems, and then they provide explanations of them. They don't start with these philosophical commitments, and that leads them to the two systems view. They start with the two systems view, which just seems, though I'm pushing back on it and calling my view limits, just seems very natural for all kinds of reasons and. In, involved in the way we talk, involved in the fact that we have law schools um, and we think that people go, you know, I've had these arguments with Mark. Mark tells me he thinks that, Mark Greenberg tells me he thinks that people go to law school to learn what the law is. Um, and that sounds like a plausible thing to say. And if you want to study moral philosophy, you go, you go to a different part of the university. So the world just presents to you in all kinds of ways the suggestion that there are two systems here. And it really is kind of a struggle. Right to see, oh no, wait a minute, maybe it's just one system, and there are reasons that we um, sometimes talk about them as if they're separate. And and that's and that's why I think it's actually, though you're right that there's nothing um, in all of Ronnie's work that's inconsistent with the idea that there's just one system. I don't think that he. I think that he's right to be surprised. Um, in By justice his own and, conclusion that it is. Yeah, because I think that he just he just fell into the standard mode of thinking about things, um, and uh, and so he had a view about how this special system was constituted. That's the view explained at length in Law's Empire. It turns out, right? That's a, and this you know he sees this in Justice and Robes. Maybe it doesn't make a difference. And the reason I think he thinks it doesn't make much of a difference in Justice and Robes is he realizes that everything I said there could just be the story of the moral impact that um, well, these practices have. That would be a surprising coincidence if everything he said there could be just as well a story about the one system, a one system story, as well as a two system story. Yeah, so, in, in, and, you know, maybe there are things that should change if you see the different sort of picture. I mean, the, you know, in, in Justice and Robes, he indicates some uncertainty, maybe nothing would change. Um, Justice for Hedgehogs, it seems maybe something would change, and Jeremy, Jeremy Waldron thinks that things will change. But, you know, whether they, but, but I just want to say, like, it just seems to me, though, though I agree with so much what you say in the paper, that you just you flip the way things look, which is you look out at the world, and it just looks like law is a distinct kind of thing, I, yeah, I and then you get explanations of it. I don't agree with that. You know, you go to the philosophy faculty, leave, leave the law faculty alone, and you see, you know, Professor so and so in this, in this class is talking about justice. Professor, uh, you know, the different professor is talking about political morality. Another one is talking about morality. Another one is talking about uh, promising. Does it mean that each one of these guys are giving lectures in separate normative domains? Of course not. You know, they just now with law, you know, if you have one big moral thing, and it gets to have its own faculty and more, far more money than anybody else. You know. so, 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 so this reflects my view, and I, when I've argued with Mark, I, I think that legal education is moral education. You come to a law school to learn something about the sure. political history of your community and the kinds of moral arguments people make about it, and um, so, so, I, so I agree with that. But I don't think it's an accident that people look at, people look at the structure of our social world and their first inclination is, is something different. Well, right? And well, it may be, it may be because it may be because the the, the the this moral domain is um, it's it's very different right than other sorts of moral domains in which we act and that leads people you know you get you get prominent lawyers right Oliver Wendell Holmes saying it'd be very clear this is not justice right um, it's it's law or yeah. Um, yeah this assumption about the many systems these many systems view yeah has percolated in the culture yes 
But but and you know a different kind first, of legal education. First year undergraduate intuitions are that you know a bunch of people get together and start doing stuff and expecting each other to comply. There you go, you get duty. They think there's mafia duty. Yeah. They're moral non-realists. Good. So so uh, so all I'm suggesting is that the it's just you, you get you get the order of explanation backwards. It's it's ra okay, Raja, so I, I, anyway, anyway. Start okay. with, start right. with why should we ask yeah. whether why there is more more than one system rather than ask why is there w just one system? I'm not sure that you know why should the should the other side have a an advantage? You know, I'm not sure about yeah. that. I'm just going to mention at this point. I mean, I'm, uh, anyway, I'm sure I can yeah. say what I want to say without framing the question that way. Yeah. It's just just developing the idea that you know you can ignore what people think when they enter a law school what to expect. Uh, I'm always struck, I mentioned um, it uh, by Ronald, Ronnie Dawkins wanting to write a book at one stage and I heard him talk about it over about four or five years and it was going to be called um, Philosopher's Tutor and Philosopher's, the Philosopher's Tutor or Philosopher's Tutor and it was going to be law and uh, you know ordinarily you think of law and philosophy as different things but here, uh, moral philosophers and others, you know, those involved in the logic of language and so on, so forth, would learn things from what lawyers do routinely, you know, part of a unified um, form of knowledge. And I find it funny, often in philosophy departments, people are thinking about these um, crazy kinds of uh, uh, hypothetical situations in order to say why utilitarianism is wrong or whatever. Whereas if you, you enter a law faculty and take it in the right spirit, you, you see all these even more fantastical situations not only actually occurred, they're real, but you can see them in their very particular circumstances and you can see what uh, usually pretty reasonable people say about uh, these things. And, I mean, maybe I'm different, but I've always thought this was just, the, these matters were just continuous. I'm not interested in what the, the, the common run of First year undergraduate thinks about what uh, law really is. Yeah, but it's not just, it's not just the first year undergraduate. I, I taught a torts opinion a few days ago where the judge begins by saying there are things that are wrong in law and there are things that are mor wrong in morals, and it hardly needs observation that these are different things. And, you know, so, um, and, and I get why the judge wants to say that, and I think I can accommodate the judge saying that from within a one system picture. Sure. But it's certainly more natural, right? Um, to read things like that written by people who are deeply engaged in the practice right. and think first inclination, two systems, and figure out the ground rules of both. And it takes no, I think that's insane. Why yeah. do you think that thing? How on earth could there be two systems, you know, floating <laughs> free of each other? You have to have either these metaphysical commitments uh, about the nature of rights and duty, or not nature of well, right and du rights and duty, normativity or what have you, or to have this conceptual analysis. Uh, I, can't, I mean, these are the two that I can think, I can think of. Why should I think? I mean, I can agree with that judge. You know, some, some things are wrong in, in law, some things are... Merely morally wrong. Merely morally wrong, yeah. Sure, mm. that's right. Yeah, so we, we agree hard. completely about that. It's just, I don't think that judge, I mean, I can't remember what judge it was. He didn't have Raza's picture. He didn't have Hart's picture. Right? Yeah, yeah, what sure. it, yeah. How do we explain that fact? I mean, that's a question that Hart himself asked. Yeah. So how law is like morality, and how is it different from morality? Mm -hmm. It's a question with which Hart begins. And I think that it's not the case that even Hart thinks that his problem is already uh, how two separate systems are related to each other. He ventures a hypothesis that shows them to be uh, two separate systems. But um, initially he says how is legal obligation related to moral obligation? So he leaves it open logically that it could be just a species of each other. So I don't think I don't even think that you know it's completely uh, an intuitive picture that it means some of you. I think you need some elaborate um, uh, philosophical machinery to sustain it, or very bad metaphysics or morals <laughs> uh, that most people in jurisprudence these days, except for Jeremy, uh, reject. Just um, um, 
I think it's a question that has a, an exegetical component, a question with an exegetical component, and then um, a, a more substantive component as well. So, in Justice in Robes, um, Dworkin uh, distinguishes the sociological concept of law and the doctrinal concept of law. And then, uh, when he discusses Raz, he says, oh, maybe Raz was committed to uh, a taxonomic concept of law, and maybe he was interested in uh, singling out, um, uh, um, uh, making taxonomy among uh, legal reasons, uh, and, I don't know, uh, singling out some of them uh, for certain purposes. And I, I was wondering whether you thought, what you thought of, of, of that idea uh, of of there being a taxonomic concept of law. Is it that, is it that Dworkin was uh, toying with the idea that there might be uh, moral powers, and those moral powers might... No, no, I think there's something much simpler here. So, uh, suppose I give you, um, you know, a, a piece of paper that has lots of propositions that uh, are propositions of law, right? And it's, only tr it's true only of some of them, that you can find them exactly this, exactly identical in, uh, statute, in the statute book, right? So the taxonomical concept of law tells you that this is hugely important, that this is a class of legal propositions that bear this direct relation to institutional history. And Raz, on this view, would say that we should reserve the name law for those, okay? And the working says, okay, that's what, what you want us to do, let's do it. Let's call those law. <laughs> but nobody cares about that stuff. What people care is that the crime calls the law. <laughs> okay, so, 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 um, so, so, so he's, he's uh, giving uh, Raz um, uh, an out, but that, has Weird, but, but, but that has nothing to do with Raz's theory. He's giving an out. <laughs> it's not much of an hour because he says it's, 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 a tri it's trivial. The tax on the concept of law is trivial. The, the concept of law that is really the, the object of contest in philosophy is the doctrinal concept of law, which makes it true that you have a right or duty that, of course, the court must enforce in his own conception. Okay. So, so, so on the back of this, um, you say that uh, the, the second route towards the uh, to to system view uh, goes through the notion of moral powers coupled Plus with the notion coupled of with the logic of action. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I take it from the way you present it that you leave it open that there might be moral powers. Well, um, I know. I, I, well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so so there might be moral powers, and if the, the our best moral theory includes. Power. Uh, this kind of moral power, then it might be that we we may have some of our legal reasons are the creation of of the successful exercise of those moral powers. Okay. And then you know which then. Well, I, what I do in the paper is not con not leave it open that moral powers exist. Uh, what I say in the paper is that let's bracket that. Because what I'm interested in is the role of these two hypotheses that there exist moral powers and that moral powers as assume, are assumed or presupposed in the action of legal institutions. I want to show what role they play. They make it possible to get rid of Hart's bad um, uh, metaphysical duty and all retain his view about the special system. Yeah. Um, so so no, what, I'm, what I'm interested in is is, is this. So in um, one of the arguments that Dworkin makes in the 30 years on paper against Raz is, you know, he's puzzled that Raz um, uh, lists a number of conditions for the successful exercise of the power the par to, to, the, to bind others. To bind others. And Mysteriously, he says that oh, we can we can separate the moral from the non-moral conditions, and then the, this the, the only the non-normative ones are part of the concept. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I took that to be uh, I, could one 
uh, deduce from that that the Raz could be uh, recast as a as an interpretivist only an interpret uh, only an interp only provided that he uh, uh, gives up this weird move uh, of separating the the moral from the non moral conditions for the exercise. I don't think that Raz would be recast as an interpretivist. I mean, in what sense would Raz be recast as an interpretivist? Because because we keep the the the, the theory about the uh, exercise of moral powers uh, as the successful exercise of moral powers as creating moral rights and duties, but then we we kind of make sense of uh, of why we uh, we should distinguish within the exercise of those moral powers the moral from the non-moral uh, conditions and reserving a special uh, conceptual role for the non-moral conditions. Non-moral conditions. I'm not sure I follow. So, if you believe in moral powers, I mean, well, well, let me say this: Raz doesn't. It's not like he separately believe, believes in the existence of moral powers, and then separately he has come to the conclusion that the moral powers are assumed or presupposed in um, by people who promise or with people who order others about or by lawyers. I think that it's the other way around. It is because he looks at the logic of this. He looks at these actions, and he notices that when I promise that I'll fly, then normally it, it, it is the case that I have a, get to have a duty to fly. How could it be that my saying those words, you know, was that moral magic? Made it the case that I'm under a duty. And Raz, is, Raz believes that it is in the logic of that action that I, just by saying so, I made it the case that I'm under a duty. And then he turns to morality to see whether morality has any room for the assumed powers. And, you know, a happy result. Morality does have room for powers. And the explanation of that is a moral explanation, of course, which is that it's, va that it's valuable that people should have that way of shaping their moral world. Right? So he really starts at the conceptual analysis and goes to the substantive moral doctrine, moral view, that moral powers exist. Uh, I am reversing the order because um, I, w I suppose I could do the, the, the other way around. It would be more confusing uh, if I did. So I want to say that near, just, be, just by believing in moral powers, you're not yet there. You don't get, get, get a special system because if, if I have moral powers, right, and I exercise them, then, all right, then duties exist. The corner of the duty depends only on what I said. So it sounds like positivist. Well, maybe. Maybe it does. Except that the duties are moral duties. They're no separate normative system. If I don't have the powers, then nothing gets done. No duty. So no special system. You, you absolutely need this conceptual hypothesis in order to be able to invent this quasi-normative special system, normative system from your point of view, which is like, um, so there are many things wrong with Raz's view, but I pretty much think that, you know, he works backwards from this supposed concept, the logic of his actions to the existence of moral powers, and then he checks to see whether, you know, it's like, like Neptune, it's like a postulated thing. Uh, his Neptune, it turns out, exists. But Raz says, what if we turned out that authority, nobody had authority, right? Um, that wouldn't show that the analysis of authority, the explanation of the nature of authority, was misguided. No, we just have found that that thing, which is part of our concept of authority, does not exist. So he wouldn't be phased if, if, if morality didn't oblige, and these powers didn't exist, if his neptune didn't exist. So, um, I, I don't think that you can you can make Raz out as an interpretist in any interesting sense. Now, why do I keep a reservation? Why don't, why don't I say directly, moral powers don't exist, as I show in my other paper? Well, because I haven't shown in any other paper that they don't exist, and I just keep my, a little bit of my mind open because I, there's Shona out there, and Shona believes in the existence of moral powers. I'm trying to understand why she thinks she believes the existence of moral powers, uh, even though in a different way than Raz. She doesn't think that she's a kind of interpretivist who believes in moral powers. So Shona explains promising in terms of moral powers, except that she thinks that 
the directional inclination is we start from at morality and we find that morality makes what people say to others relevant to what duties they have, um, and we take it from there. I'm not uh, so I'm making I'm leaving some room until such time as I completely understand what Shona says. Uh, but my um, inclination is to disbelieve in the existence of moral powers, and and I certainly don't believe, and I have written elsewhere about why not, that the concept of promising or the logic of these actions contain this kind of information in them. This is really, um, you know, wishful thinking, that metaphysics is pack, packaged inside the concepts, and sp in particular inside the understanding that's sufficient for any one of us to be credited on the concept. I mean, that would be impressive. Mm -hmm. So the last question, it's Emil Flores. Well, congratulations uh, on the on the paper. I think it was also really good in going through to, to your points and how the hybrid doesn't work and how the non-hybrid model, uh, that instead of the two pictures, it's the ones you... Sorry? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Only closer to you. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I was congratulating you on the paper, and I think it was really nice how you were keeping away the, the, the two system and the, as a hybrid model and keeping like the, the one model, the, the one system. So I think that the, the, that was nicely done. And I would like to point to something that you said in your paper, page 20, just before uh, you mentioned the postulatory concept and the reference to George Ray. Um, you're talking about the moral explanation of law, therefore faces a serious hurdle. And that's the part I'm very interested in, and I would like to ask you a, a little bit on what do you make out of this? You say, it must show how it can be that an account of how things ought to be, that is, the fairness dictates that certain decisions stand, can at the same time, and I would like to stress at the same time, be an account of how things are in the nature. Uh, that the pertinent reasons of fairness that favor stereotypes decisis determine the contribution of a person to the law, and then of course you go into interpretation, postulatory concepts, and then uh, this being, uh, in, uh, this theory being interpretive, so developing and refining the relationship between history and duty, that is assuming common reflection, going back and forth. Yes. So I, I tend to think that that's one of the major points of Dworkin's methodology, is to break this kind of descriptive normative and to be working at the same time in the two levels. In the, in the ought to be and the how things are at the same time. No, no. I, I think they do, yeah. yeah. So, That's so, what he's trying to do. So, so I would like, no, I, I completely agree on what you're saying. I just want to point out and would like to ask you if you build much more on that, on this, uh, in this Dworkinian move, in this kind of how the methodology uh, can be reflected in this kind of statements. We already have mentioned the, the one right answer thesis and also Hercules. And the, the thing that sometimes comes is, is depending on the, on the power of your side, is you can see there will always be, there is, there must be one right answer. So that, that's the part of, of Dworkin that is always, some people will say this is ambiguous, but I think that's, that's really embedded in what Dworkin is really saying and doing, because that's the interpretive part, the ability part, which is making the, well, this seems to be like this at this time, but it really has to be this diff in this different way at, it truly really is this differently, it ought to be different, so, something like that. So, I can, and I can try to relate that to the previous point I was trying to make about the, the non, no, no, not smoking and then the, the, coffee, the coffee cups. And my point was that uh, the, the not smoking, it was used to be in the classroom that professors will be smoking, and at some point we came to with this rule, but the underlying principle was already there. It only came after we decided, well, this is really wrong. We are, the moral principle underlying is the, the risking the health of so, someone else. So you decide to go enact a rule, but the underlying principle, justifying principle, was already there. So that's the sense in which I think. And my point is that this idea of the cops in the, in the, in the classroom is misleading because it's really not, not something against drinking in the, or having coffee in the classroom. It's a matter more of the, of the trash that we'll be leaving behind us. So we are not finding which is the really underlying principle on, on, on the case. So in this evaluative, interpretive approach 
is the one that will lead us the way in which, well, actually, which is the rule we have to enforce here. That people come with a cup with a tap on top, that we call, come with bottles with taps, we come with, so that's the, the kind of thing that I, I think it is the, and I right. take your paper like doing that, like emphasizing the, the importance of Dworkin in pointing us the thing of the, the role of interpretation in doing this move at the same time. Thank you very much. And I'll just, let me just say two things. So uh, initially, many people were wrong-footed by Dworkin's arguments. They said, how could how things ought to be, what, ought to, what the law ought to be, have anything to do with what the law is, right? They're two different things. And then, if the, as if that were not enough, Dworkin came back with the theory uh, laid out in the Law of the Empire, and then he claimed something, something even more preposterous in these people's eyes. They said, how can it be that how things ought to be, namely that we should, what we should do now uh, ought to depend, ought to turn on our institutional practice, how can that have anything to do with what, how things must be, that is, the nature of the thing, right? So, how things ought to be, how things are, how they must be. And Dworkin, at the beginning of Law's Empire, he anticipates that kind of objection, and um, the semantic thing question, the famous semantic thing question, he's about to throw on us a fully moralized explanation of law. How could that be an explanation of law rather than a program for reform? And he says, well, there is this uh, philosophical prejudice according to which um, in, we, we, in order uh, for us to be talking about the same thing, we must agree on, we must share an understanding of how things must be if they are, if, if something is to be the case. So in order to be sure that we're both, you and I are talking about law, we, you and I must share an understanding of how things must be, how non-legal facts must be, for there to be law. Okay? And that's a prejudice, says Dworkin. That's right? That's a prejudice. Okay. People are, can do very well debating, um, th th talking about the same things, that is, sharing a subject matter without sharing necessary truths that are supposedly defined them, that are supposed to define the subject matter. So it's not the case that you and I have to agree on how things must be if it is to be the law that P in order for us sensibly to discuss what, what would make it the case that wh whether a law is P or what would make it the case that it is. So it's not, it's not true that we have to go through this non-moral, purely conceptual uh, level where we only talk about how things are in their nature before we can sensibly go and talk about normative matters. Um, there's a long history, of course. Um, um, Peter Strawson used to distinguish between descriptive metaphysics and revisionary metaphysics. And he thought that descriptive metaphysics just described our conceptual scheme, the tacit assumptions and suppositions uh, that are sort of built into our talk about things. And descriptive metaphysics teases that out and tells us how things must be in their nature. And that's all descriptive. It couldn't be moral. So when Dworkin, initially Dworkin confused people by, by talk, talking about moral matters, how, thing, how things ought to be, and saying that he's talking about how the law is. And then he sort of redoubled on that. He started talking about how things ought to be, moral matters, you know, talk about the nature of law, not just this content. So this is what I, um, the kind of objection that I have in mind here. And I'm saying that, we can't, it's, you know, it's been many years since we've come a long way, but I'm pretty sure that most readers' reaction to a straightforward, simple, uh, moral explanation of the nature of law, such as Marx, for example, Mark Greenberg's, uh, they come out very confused. How could what Greenberg is saying be about the nature of the thing, about the nature of law? Right? How, could ev how could ever be the case that a story about how the moral situation changes by institutional action is the law? We need an extra st step. So this is, this is the kind of thing I wanted to address. So, yeah, so the, the, I, I, the, this, 
So your coffee example and your water bottle example and the smoking example, these are all content questions. You know, normality, I'm sorry, moral issues, should he, should he bring in to the room um, these things? And uh, the role of institutional history in, in explanation of current duties. And the, 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 the point I was making on page 20 was related not to to, to the, the second level, whether the nature of something can turn on substantive questions about how things ought to be. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your time and for your lectures and answering all these questions. Of course, there are plenty of more questions and things to debate a long time, but we have to go on. And let me just make a quick reminder.